Well, here it is, guys. The biggest video in the entire series. This is section six, and this video is on ships. We go over all kinds of stuff on ships in this video. The different major manufacturers with just a few ships on each of their lineup. Uh, we go over some smaller companies. We go over ground vehicles, grab lev vehicles. We'll go over Van Duel ships. And trust me, we're not even getting to half of the ships that are in the game. We'll go over different types of weapon systems for your ships and how to outfit your ships in the Moby Glass and in Urkel Dot Games and things like that. So while this is going to be a long video, I hope it's educational and comprehensive. And I really hope you enjoy the footage. And without further ado, let's roll that intro. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, let's start talking about ships here. Um, we are down to section six in the video, and uh, we're just going to kind of go over a little bit about some of these companies and uh, some of the some of the ships that they make. This does not is not an exhaustive list of ships. Um, this game has so many more ships than what we're going to cover here. This is just kind of a brief overview. So here on the intro page, we can see um, this is a constellation. Um, uh, it, I believe it's the Andromeda. And uh, we will go over this ship uh, in the game a little bit. We do fly it around. So look for that. Um, so let's talk about manufacturers. The first manufacturer we want to talk about is Anvil Aerospace. It is actually my favorite manufacturer in the game, Anvil. And um, they are a Terra-based manufacturing spaceship, uh, spaceship manufacturing company. Um, Terra is kind of like a super Earth um, environment in the game. Um, and I just kind of think uh, Anvil is a very iconic type of name. Um, it's a very Chris Roberts type of name because... He used to run a company called Digital Anvil. Um, I don't want to get too much into the lore uh, of Anvil Aerospace, but uh, they do have, uh, now that we're past the Mezer era in game uh, with the, the dictator rule, um, Anvil Aerospace is getting a lot more contracts because uh, Aegis was very tied in with the Mezers. So plays a big part in the game, and it also has my absolute favorite ship in the game. Um, so, <laughs> speaking of my absolutely favorite ship of the game, that would be the Anvil Carrick. Um, I, I really enjoy the Carrick. It is, it's the reason I really became a concierge member, um, because it is a very expensive ship. Um, it's a multi-crew explorer that has, uh, pathfinding capabilities. I mean, it really is an explorer ship. It, it's not meant to be self-sustaining, but... Uh, it is actually a civilian version of a military ship. It's kind of like a surplus, and it comes with a a snub ship called the uh, the Pisces, which we're not necessarily going to show here in the Anvil section. Um, it also comes with a, a ground vehicle called the Ursa Rover. So it just has it's a large ship. It has a lot of parts to it. It has a you know it has a bridge with the pilot, the co-pilots. It has an upper command station area where the captain can be, with the the remote turret gunners. It has big man turrets. It's got a back turret. It's got a medical facility on board. It's got a hangar bay. It's got a cartography room for mapping out jump points and pathfinding stuff. It has a ton of cargo. 456 SCU of cargo. Uh, it's got a garage. It has a drone room where you'll be able to deploy drones. It's got a mess hall. It has a captain's quarters. It's got crew quarters. It's got, it really has got it all. It's it's such an awesome ship. Um, you can buy it in game. Uh, it costs about twenty two and a half million alpha UBC. Uh, you can buy it in real life. Uh, it goes right now for about six hundred bucks. Um, so it's it's pretty pretty expensive. Um. But, you know, we're supposed to be able to swap out some of the modules instead of the cargo base and stuff. And it has a number of paints and things like that. So awesome ship. The next ship we'll talk about with Anvil is the Liberator. So the, the Liberator is the 
what's a good name for it? The Pocket Carrier would be a good name for it. It is actually another large ship. It's not actually in the game right now, but uh, it's going to have a little bit of cargo. It's going to have 400 SEO cargo. Well, it's not little. It's a lot. But really, the main purpose of the Liberator is to save on fuel, right? So you're going to park other ships onto its hangar platforms, and it's going to... Uh, be able to kind of lock them in. It's going to it's gonna be able to carry those smaller ships, you know, further out into space. And that'll become important in, in the pyro system because it's it's pretty large and you're not going to be able to fly a ship with a size one um, all over there without being able to stop for gas. And, and the Liberator is going to have a lot of fuel. And so it's going to be able to take ships to other places. So the pocket carrier and it's going to have a small crew as well. Um, the next ship we'll talk about is the F7 Hornet. So the Hornet has a, and there's a lot of ships in the Hornet line. There is the F7A Hornet, which is the military variant of the Hornet. Um, it's also the first uh, military Hornet. You're going to probably see this in Squadron 42. It's kind of one of the hero ships. Um, it's... It's real nice. Uh, <laughs> all of the weapon systems are, are, are a size higher than the civilian version. Uh, there's also the F7A Hornet Mark II, which is the latest version. We'll probably see that in Squadron 42 as well, I hope. Uh, there are very, very few F7A and F7A Mark IIs in Star Citizen. Um, those ships do exist. People were able to buy them, but you definitely can't buy them anymore. So... As far as rarity and exclusivity go, um, super rare, super exclusive, and honestly, probably some of the best ships in the game for dogfighting. Um, some of the other variants of the Hornet series are uh, the F7C Hornet, which is the civilian version of the single seat Hornet. Um, you have the F7CR, the Hornet Tracker, which is kind of the scout version of the Hornet. And it has a radar, uh, like a, an advanced radar and sensor suite instead of the turret on top. Uh, you have the Hornet Ghost, the F7CS, S for stealth. A uh, stealth version of the Hornet comes uh, with black. It has reduced emissions and it has void armor to evade scanners. So when stealth gameplay is more firmly rooted, uh, that should be a really cool ship. Um... There is the F7CM uh, Super Hornet. Uh, the Super Hornet is it's really close to the F7C, uh, kind of a mix between the C and the A, but it actually has a passenger seat in the back for a radar intercept, op intercept officer like a Rio, or basically what that person can do is they can help run systems and things, and they can also enter the remote turret, which is the very top turret, and so they can run that stuff. And it comes to fault with a better default loadout than a regular Hornet. Um, you have a couple other variants of this being the F7C Hornet Wildfire, the single seater. And it's part of the Masters of Flight series. Um, and it has it's it's a different loadout and a different paint job. But other than that, it's the same as the regular F7C. And then you have the. Uh, the F7CM Super Hornet, the Heartseeker Edition, which is the Valentine's Day Edition, which has, it's just really, really a Super Hornet, a little bit different loadout, but it comes with a cool uh, Valentine's Day type of thing on the front of the, uh, in the paint. So kind of a little bit of throwback to World War II uh, on the Hornet. Um, the last uh, anvil ship we'll talk about is the F8C Lightning. Um, that's the newest civilian version of the newest Anvil ship, the F-8C. Um, really, the F-8A is the military version, just like the Hornet. And that thing is just tearing up Van Duel left and right out on the front lines. But the F-7C, the civilian version, this is a ship that I do own um, because I put way too much money in the game. But uh, it is, the concept of it is one of my favorite ships. Um, it is... It, Back in the day, they said, you're going to be able to get this if you um, complete Squadron 42. You're going to be able to get it in Star Citizen. So uh, they do show it on the displays at, uh, I believe, Invictus and IAE. Um, so the hull for it at least exists. And it, it's, it looks like a cool ship. It's going to be a, a heavy fighter kind of um, competition with the Vanguard series with Aegis. But uh, 
looks really cool. And then if you spend a lot of money in game, <laughs> you'll get the executive edition, which is kind of lined with gold. So pretty cool stuff from Anvil Aerospace. Now let's talk about Aegis Dynamics. It is Aegis Dynamics is a uh, spacecraft and uh, a component manufacturer. Um, they are known for their very militaristic UEE military ships. Um, I believe right now, and they are still Earth based. Um, actually, they're they're in a they have headquarters. Well, they started at Earth. They have headquarters at uh, in the Davian system. Um, so Aegis makes some really iconic ships. Um, th they are a throwback to the Mezer era where they were really fighting a lot of wars with the Tavaran, the bird-like species in the game. And we won both of those wars. The UEE did, the humans did. And Aegis was a big, big part of that. So the Mezers gave them a lot of contracts. Um, one of the biggest ships in the game is the Aegis Idris. The Idris is a, well, the Idris, we'll talk about the Idris M. It is a massive military ship. Um, it's got a big size 10, I believe, a rail gun on the bottom that just annihilates things. It is a frigate. Um, the M stands for military. It is larger than a Corvette, but smaller than a destroyer. Um, it does pack a lot of punch. I believe it is the main ship that's going to be in Squadron 42. So um, Idris is just a it's a badass ship um, and it's very large. They've been working on the Idris for years and I think most of it's actually probably done, but I don't think we're necessarily going to be able to see it in the game until Squadron 42 is released. By that, I mean... We see it flying around. We are able to shoot them down in missions, and we are able to do stuff like Xeno Threat with Idrises, but really, the Idris is going to be... Uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to actually fly it and crew it ourselves until Squadron 42 comes out. A lot of history with the Idris. Um, there is a couple variants of the Idris. There's the Idris P, which is the Peacekeeper variant of the Idris. Um, and... There is also the Idris K, I believe, which is kind of a aftermarket special edition of the Idris P um, that is tailored to kind of dealing with the swarm threat of carrier type ships. Uh, it, it's got other lasers, other uh, point defense turrets, just kind of different loadout. You know, it has it has a lot of cargo too, 995 SCU on the Idris K. Um so really cool ship with the Idris. Moving on, let's talk about the Aegis Hammerhead. This is a ship that is in game now. Um, the Aegis Hammerhead is, I guess I would call it a gunship, but I would call it like a, like a heavy gunship. It is made to be a picket ship. It has these um, five, I believe it's five man turrets. Uh, four of them are on the sides, two on each side, port and starboard, and then there's one in the in the on the top. And there might be one on the bottom too. Um, I believe all in all, there's seven turrets that can be completely manned up. The pilot does not have weapons, but the, the hammerhead kind of has that iconic hammerhead shark look to the front. Um, it is, it is made to really take down fighters and uh, as a picket ship, it is not meant to take on other capital ships one-on-one. -on -one. And it is not a capital ship itself. It is a support ship to take out fighters that works with uh, other capital ships like an Idris or a Javelin or things like that. Um, but the Hammerhead is a beast of a ship, one of the biggest ships in the game right now. And very cool, very, very uh, Aegis looking on the inside and stuff like that. So um, awesome ship with the Hammerhead. I believe you can pick this up in game for about, let's see, um, the pricing game. About 12 and a half million alpha UEC. Uh, if you want to buy one to own, you can do that. They go for just over $700, about $725 right now. So a very expensive ship, but a very cool ship. Next up, let's talk about one of the newer Aegis ships, the Aegis Redeemer. Um, so the Redeemer is a ship that was thought up by the fans and originally was supposed to be more of a drop ship, but it has kind of turned into a gunship slash dropship it has these really cool uh, scissor engines um 
it's really cool animation. I really, I, I actually like the Redeemer. I like the look of the Redeemer. Um, it, it's a bigger ship. It is not as heavy of a gunship as a Hammerhead, but it is certainly a gunship. Um, I we've we've almost taken out an Idris single handedly with the Redeemer. Uh, I'd definitely taken out many Hammerheads with it. The pilot has weapons. Um, there's a chin turret the pilot can control, or it can be remote turreted, and the pilot has two other, I believe, size four guns. Um, but the main power from, from the Redeemer is there are two manned turrets that have size five ballistics guns, and they're on the top and the bottom, and those things are super powerful, and they just tear stuff up. And then there is actually a remote turret that can be manned uh, that sits at the back of the ship. So... Really cool ship, in my opinion. Um, got some really good shielding as well. So, you know, think about the Redeemer. Um, you can't buy it in game as of 3.16.1, but maybe next patch. And it goes for about 300 bucks on the open market. Next ship we'll talk about is the iconic fighter in the game, the Gladius. The main ship for Squadron 42, what you'll be flying a lot of. The uh, the Gladius has been around for quite a while uh, in game lore, um, but it's been updated over the years, you know, new avionics and stuff. It's kind of an interceptor slash escort ship, but it is ultimately a very maneuverable, very agile and fast light fighter. It doesn't pack the amount of weapons that like the Hornet does, but it is faster and it's more agile. So if you have a, a pilot that can use that to their advantage, you could probably easily take out heavier anvil ships with it you can buy this ship in game for about 1.1 million off of uc or you can buy it for about 90 dollars in real money um not sure if there's a military variant of the gladius i don't think so um but like no cargo or anything it is made to be a fighter ship and it is definitely one of the best in the game okay let's move on to misc which also is an acronym it stands for musashi industrial and starflight concern so MISC is a, think of it as like, I almost want to say the Toyota of Star Citizen. It is a company that works with, um, it started out by themselves, but then they have worked with the Xi'an um, on numerous type of ships. And some of their uh, more iconic ships are very much inspired by the Xi'an. And the Xi'an actually like MISC and, and their company. MISC deals a lot with, I want to say uh, corporate, not so much corporate, commercial, commercial and a little bit of industrial in the type of ships that they make. And then they, for some reason, they have a racing team as well. I guess when you have that kind of money, you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, they are based out of the Centauri system, um, but they are a human manufacturer. So the first ship we'll talk about with MISC is the iconic freelancer, probably what MISC is known best for. Uh, the Freelancer, to me, looks like a giant Cylon Raider that's made for cargo. But uh, uh, the MISC uh, Freelancer, so kind of a medium range cargo hauler. Um, the base model, uh, 66 SCU in it. Um, it's a cool ship. Uh, it, it's got, it was supposed to have VTOL and the thrusters were supposed to move around and stuff, but they don't anymore. Um, so uh, it's, I don't know, it, it's a basic light cargo ship, uh, maybe light to medium freight slash cargo ship, but it has some cool designs. I really like that it has size three guns that are on the side that are fully gimbaled. They, you know, come with it. They're bespoke gimbals. So I kind of like that. Um, we're not really going to talk about it with MISC, but they also, because the ships aren't in the game, but they have the hull series, which are also cargo haulers, the hull A, B, C, D, and E. And, you know, what they've said about the whole C was that it's the most popular ship in, in the game. Um, as far as NPCs goes, the most populous ship. You'll see hull Cs everywhere because they haul cargo around and they have these big cargo crates attached to them. Uh, 3.17, we're supposed to see the hull A, and I think we will. The very first of their cargo ships that carry about 80 SCU. So even more than the Freelancer. Okay. The next ship we're going to talk about is a ship I wanted to love, but I actually upgraded mine. It is the Misc Odyssey. It's a brand new ship sold in uh, our real years of 2021 at IAE. It is 
It's a large expedition type ship. Uh, it's a multi-crew explorer. Um, and it's made for long duration. Um, it's going to have huge, you know, it's a capital size ship. So it's going to have huge capital shields. It's not surprisingly, it's not going to have that much cargo in it. Only about 250 cargo uh, space in it. It goes uh, for about six, uh, 700 bucks standalone right now. Uh, you can't buy it in game because it doesn't actually exist yet. It's still concept and they are not currently working on it. Um, it's going to have a hangar. It'll accommodate a single small ship, so sort of like a Carrick. Uh, some people have called it the Carrick Killer. I don't see that. The Carrick is made for actual exploration. The Miss Goddessy is made more for expedition. And it's made to be self-sufficient, meaning it has a mining laser on that big ship because it looks like a giant freelancer. Um, but it's also supposed to be able to mine and refine Quantanium. And that Quantanium goes directly into the fuel tanks for the Odyssey. So, and it's also supposed to scoop up a lot of hydrogen. So you should fuel wise be very, very self-sufficient. And I believe it also has the ability to refuel other ships. So it's going to have a tractor beam, stuff like that. It'll have a medical bay. So it's, it's going to be a cool ship. I have no doubt. I just, that's not what I was wanting. I wanted a ship that could mine and refine anything out long range and then eventually make some port calls once it fills up its cargo bay. And then, you know, I, I guess I don't I don't just want to stay out in space for a month and live out in space for a month and just mine. So that's why I got rid of the Odyssey. All right. Next ship, the Misk Prospector, probably the most popular um, of the Misk line of ships. It is the single player mining ship. Um, it's made just for single player. Um, it's got a bed and a toilet and everything in there, and it's got one seat for the miner. Um, every, it's a size one type ship. So small ship, it's got 32 SCU of cargo made for, uh, the mining, uh, the stuff you extract while you're mining. It fits on the saddlebags on the side, pretty iconic ship. You are supposed to be able to detach those saddlebags at some point, um, and store them maybe in another ship or something. And then uh, you go right back out and keep on mining. The Prospector sells in-game for about $2 million Alpha UBC, or you can buy it for about $155 in real money. Like I said, one of the most popular ships of the game because it is a mining ship and it is single-player mining. And we'll get into multiplayer mining here in a little bit. Okay, and the last ship we want to talk about with the MISC lineup is going to be the Razor. For <laughs> I did pick the Razor. I probably should have picked the Starfarer, but the Razor is a racer that was developed by Misk to, to win the 2947 Murray Cup, um, which is the, the the racing kind of like Formula One or, or NASCAR or something like that. More Formula One. But uh, it's a pretty cool ship. It's really fast. It's actually really horrible in atmosphere, as, as are all the racing ships. But uh I don't know. I thought it was pretty cool. I do love the design of the Misk Razor. I like the way it looks. It looks like a Formula One car. Um, it, it is it is pretty fun to fly, um, but it's it's just it's just kind of crazy. And it has this whole lore to it with the Proteus system and the Misk Daedalus and and things like that. And Misk making a racing team and things like that. So um, if you're interested in in a cool racing ship, the Misk Razor. Um, it comes with a couple different variants. There's a stealth variant uh, as well to the to the Razor uh, called the EX. And then there's the Razor LX, which is uh, supposed to be like the drag racer of Star Citizen, where, where the regular Razor is more of a can turn corners type of thing. So there you go, folks. Misk Razor. Next manufacturer is Robert Space Industries itself, are called RSI. A uh, multinational corporation that designs, manufactures, and sells spaceships, vehicles, ship components, and space suits. It's one of the oldest human companies. Uh, it is still based on Earth in New York City uh, in the Sol system. Uh, its founder is, surprise, surprise, Chris Roberts. Uh, now, this is a in-game different Chris Roberts, long dead, um, but it is supposed to represent the real-life Chris Roberts. Um RSI has some really iconic ships, and they were the, really the first ones to kind of master quantum travel. And uh, with Dr. Scott Childress, there's a ton of lore behind them and some stuff that, you know, stuff with the Meser era and fighting war against the Tavarin and things like that. So RSI, really cool history. 
So let's talk about probably one of the most iconic ships in the game. <laughs> and that would be the RSI Constellation. Um, one of my favorite ships, actually. Um, it is a multi-person freighter manufactured by RSI. Uh, it's the base model. It's, uh, the Andromeda is the base model. And it comes with a snub ship, uh, the P-52 Merlin, docked at the stern as a snub fighter. Uh, the Aquila version, the science version of the Constellation, also has the P-52 Merlin. Uh, the Constellation Taurus, which is the cargo variant of the Constellation, does not have a fighter at all. It, instead, it has a shielded cargo area back there. And then uh, the last variant of the Constellation series is the Constellation Phoenix, and the Phoenix Emerald is a skin, but the, the Phoenix, which has a P-72 Archimedes Kruger snub fighter uh, tucked away in the back, and that is the luxury travel variant of the Constellation. The Constellation has really good pilot guns. Excuse me. Really good pilot guns. They have uh, manned turrets on all versions of the ships. Um, some of the versions have, uh, like the Aquila has a science turret. Um, I believe the Taurus has a tractor beam turret. Um, but they can do a lot of damage. They hold about 96 SEU of cargo in their giant cargo area, which can also hold vehicles. Um like the Andromeda, the base version, 52 missiles on that ship, plus four size four guns, plus two man turrets. So it can do a lot of damage if it wants to. Um, it's, it is, I would refer to it as the Star Citizen version of the Millennium Falcon, if I could. So awesome ship. I definitely suggest giving it a try. Um, about 240 bucks in real money and in game. They go for about three and a half million alpha UVC. The next ship, the RSI Mantis. I didn't know if I wanted to include this in here, but uh, I don't. I don't think it gets enough love. The Mantis is a single seat interdiction ship uh, capable of pulling targets out of quantum travel using a quantum enforcement device, a QED. Uh, it's pretty lightly armed. It, it cannot take a beating at all. There's no cargo or anything, so it's made to work in tandem with a group um, of more heavily armed either law enforcement or pirates to confront captured ships. Um, it's a cool concept. It does work. You can interdict people. And this ship goes for about 1.2 million alpha UEC in game or about $150 standalone if you want it in real life. All right, let's talk about the next ship, which a lot of you probably have had if you're newer to the game, the Constellation, or I'm sorry, the RSI Aurora. Uh, the Aurora is a starter ship. Um, the Aurora MR, which most people get as their starter ships, uh, the MR stands for uh, Mark, I believe. Um, I don't think it's Marquee. I think it's Mark. Um, but it's it's focused. It's a light fighter, but um, it's, I guess, kind of focused on interdiction. Um, it, there's not much you can do with it. You can do cargo missions if you want four SCU of cargo. I'm sorry, three SCU of cargo for the MR. Um you could do box missions with it. You could do some very light dog fighting with it. It's it's a starter ship. It, it is what you expect it to be. Four size one weapons, um, but everything else small sized. There are other variants of the Aurora. There is the Aurora CL, which is um, uh, focused on cargo transportation. Uh, the CL stands for Clipper, and it actually has six SCU of cargo. Other than that, it's pretty much the same as the other uh, Aurora's, um, there's the Aurora ES, uh, which is known as the essential. Um, I guess it is the most common starter ship is what I'm reading here. Um, but I believe the MR is what comes with the starter package. Uh, I do have an ES uh, that I got as a referral bonus last year from somebody. Um, it has three SEO cargo crew one, pretty much the same as everything else. They just come with different starting loadouts. Um, there is a couple differences though. There is the Aurora LX, which is known as the deluxe version of the Aurora. Um, three SEO cargo in that. Um, it kind of comes with patent leather interior and things like that. Um, but other than that, other than the premium comfort. Uh, it really doesn't have anything else that the other Auroras don't have. And lastly, probably my favorite Aurora, just because I'm more of a combat focused guy, is the Aurora LN or Legionnaire, which actually comes with uh, more missiles. Uh, it comes stock with a better shield generator and uh, additional 
uh, hard points there. It has three SEO cargo like the other ones. Um, so um, the LNs can carry uh, four size one missiles uh, or a single size four missile. So pretty cool on the front of the Aurora. The next ship we'll talk about is the gigantic Bengal carrier. Uh, technically the second biggest ship in the game, but right now the biggest we've ever seen. It does fly around during Invictus launch week. This is an aircraft carrier, really a spacecraft carrier. Um, it It's freaking awesome. Um, it can carry multiple squadrons of fighters, bombers, and support craft. Um, just like any other aircraft carrier, it's usually the nucleus of a battle fleet or task task force, right? It's a capital ship. It could crew over 700 people in its crew. It's about 990 meters in length. Um, that's very impressive. Um, it's it's just huge, right? Um, there's, there's not that much to it that I really want to go over other than, hey, it's an aircraft carrier. Um, no, you're never going to be able to buy one. Uh, real money, but uh, you're not going to be able to buy one in game either because they are made for the military. But there are some derelicts out there that, that CAG says we, we might be able to put some back together and then as an orc and then actually have a have a carrier that we could use. So the possibilities are out there for the Bengal carrier. All right. Next up, let's talk about Drake. Drake, one of the coolest manufacturers in the game. Um, they, they are a little bit pirate, but, uh, <laughs> they like that and they know that, uh, Drake is a human spacecraft company that, uh, designs, manufactures and sells spaceships. Um, they're based out of the Magnus system. Um, some of the key people like Jan Dredge is the founder of, of Drake. They, they are a little bit more racy. They kind of have a scandal going with, uh, they, they, they don't necessarily sell to pirates, but pirates really like using their ships. And But they do have some of the more iconic ships in the game. First up, let's talk about the Kraken. The Drake Kraken is possibly top five, one of my favorite ships, even though it's probably years away from uh, coming out in the game. It is a multi-role light carrier. Um, it's going to have a crew of up to around 10. It's going to have about 3,800 SCO cargo. But it's, it's not like the Liberator as it's a pocket carrier. It's a light aircraft carrier or spacecraft carrier. You're going to be able to have ships docked on top of it and be able to do things with it. It has really big guns. It's a capital sized ship. It's just huge. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, the Drake Kraken and be able to run that with the org and be able to go do some really fun, fun stuff with it. Um, there is a variant of the Kraken. And it is called the Kraken Privateer, and it is similar to the Banu Merchantman in that it makes the Kraken a flying private marketplace slash bazaar where you'll be able to set up vendors and shops and things like that in the Kraken. And people can land and go shopping and you'll transact and then they'll get on their ship and they'll leave. So that's a really cool concept for the Kraken as well. Next ship we'll talk about is the infamous Cutlass series for uh, the the game, uh, the Cutlass, uh, there's different variants of the Cutlass, but basically the Cutlass is a low cost, kind of easy to maintain solution for local uh, in-system militia type units. Um, it's a medium, it's considered a medium fighter. Uh, you can easily run this with a solo crew of one, but it really shines with a crew of two, either someone in the co-pilot seat or someone, depending on the variant, uh, if they're in the turret. Um, some of the different variants uh, we'll talk about is the Cutlass Black, which is the main variant. Um, Cutlass Black has about 46 cargo. It has a wide cargo area, so you can fit things like a rock in there and go mining. Fits quite a bit of cargo. It has a turret on top, man turret. Um, so there's lots of stuff you can do with the Drake Cutlass Black. Um, the next variant would be the Cutlass Blue, which is more of a police variant of the Cutlass series. Uh, it has flashing lights. And, I don't think it has sirens, but flashing lights. Uh, it replaces most of the cargo space inside of it with prison pods. Um, so that is the police version of the Cutlass, even though the UEE police don't use it. Then you have the Cutlass Red, um, which is the ambulance version of the Cutlass, um, kind of a search and rescue type of thing. It does not have a man turret up top. It has a searchlight turret instead. 
Um, but it has med beds in the cargo area. Um, so that's pretty cool uh, for the Cutlass. Um, and it has flashing lights as well, like an ambulance. And then the last version, which just got introduced, the train wreck of a ship called the Cutlass Steel. It is a troop transport variant of the Cutlass. Um, it replaces all of the cargo space with jump seats. So if you want to put a bunch of people into a Cutlass um, with extra turrets, like size... I think they're size one. They could be size two ballistic turrets. Um, they actually have a lot of ammo on them because they're tied in directly into the ship. Um, that would be the Cutlass Steel, kind of made for as a drop ship um, with lots of ballistic firepower. So that is the Cutlass series. Next up, we'll talk about the Drake Caterpillar. One Definitely one of my top five favorite ships right now in the game. It is a giant cargo ship. Um, large size ship, size three shields. Uh, 576 SCU of cargo, um, crew of two to four, because it does have some man turrets and stuff like that in it. Um, this ship is made to transport cargo. At the very front of that ship, all that is cargo area. Um, the ship is supposed to be one of the first ones, uh, besides Retaliator, that we're going to get modularity on. You'll be able to swap out those cargo modules, different modules. And one of the cool things about the Caterpillar is... The command module is actually a separate ship, so you sh you will be able to in the future detach the command section. Let's say you leave the caterpillar up in space, you detach the the command section, you fly down on the planet, make a couple deals, fly back up to your caterpillar, bada boom, bada bing. You know you can, you'll be able to do different stuff with it. Um, you want to purchase caterpillar it goes for about three hundred thirty dollars of real money right now, or you can buy it in game for about four point six million off of UEC. Um, it's going to have a giant tractor beam as well, so that's definitely there for multi-crew gameplay. Lots of different color paints for the Caterpillar right now. Um, I actually have a pirate Caterpillar, so uh, that that's a whole different story of how to get those. So, <laughs> Next ship we're going to talk about is the Drake Corsair. Uh, so this ship is not in game right now, but it is currently being worked on, and we should see this in 2022. It is a multi-crew exploration ship, Although on the small side, uh, but that kind of gives up a lot of its defenses and armor for increased versatility and firepower. It is only the second ship in the game that is going to be asymmetrical. The other ship is going to be the Mercury Star Runner by Crusader. Um, man, I think the Corsair looks really cool. Um, it's going to have uh, crew quarters and a scanning suite. Um, it's going to have quite a bit of, of uh, uh, fuel. Uh, the cargo capacity is not huge, 72 SCU right now, but uh, we'll see what that is when it releases. It should be able to fit a, a some kind of a rover or vehicle. Um, it's still in concept, though, so if you're interested in the Drake version of an exploration ship um, with a ramp, by the way, um, uh, it's easier to load vehicles with a ramp than by cargo bay. Um, it goes for about 215 bucks of real money. Okay, let's talk about Origin. Origin Jump Works, GmbH, <laughs> which is some, I think that's a German corporation thing. Uh, it is a spaceship and engine manufacturer of high quality and luxury products headquartered in the Terra system. They actually used to pride themselves of being headquartered in the Sol system and saying, hey, all this stuff comes from Earth. But then later on in their lore, they were like, nope, we're moving to Terra. And people got really pissed off. So a <laughs> little bit of a scandal kind of with that. First ship we'll talk about is the infamous 890 Jump from Origin. The, I believe right now, the biggest ship in the game that you can actually pilot. Um, it is a luxury uh, cruise type ship and a super yacht is what it would be. It's two for touring. It is a capital size ship with capital size shields. It's got a ton of cargo on it. 484 SCU of cargo. Um, in game, it goes for about 32 million Alpha UEC in real life. It is on a t uh, very a quantity limited sale. Or you can only get it at uh, IAE in uh, uh, November. And it goes for just about a thousand bucks of real money. Um, it's got point defense system. It's got turrets. It's got a hangar. It's got a cargo bay. It's got multiple high luxury rooms. Nice rooms for the crew. Really nice stuff for the captain of the ship. It's got atrium. It's got a bar. Oh, the ship has so much going for it. It's huge. It's awesome. It's super fun. Um, so check out the 890 Jump when you get a chance. The next ship we'll talk about is it's 
the 890 Jump's little brother, I guess, the 600i, which is also an amazing ship. Um, one of the most powerful ships in the game, actually, right now, if it's fully manned, um, because it has size 3 shields. It's a large multi-crew uh, expedition ship. And there's two versions of the 600i, the Explorer version and the Touring version. The Explorer version is made for expedition. doesn't have a lot of cargo space or anything, but it does fit a rover in it. Um, but it's made for luxury exploration. So, you, you know, that day trip that people go on out to the rings of Saturn to go do some stuff, you know, whatever that is. But they want to come back and live in the lap of luxury. That is the 600i. Um, although the captain of the ship gets probably the best view of anybody in the game. Um, but it's got a cool wraparound canopy and... Um, it comes with an Origin G12 Touring Rover, uh, which is not in-game yet, but that's going to be a cool little uh, car-type vehicle. Um, but like I said, there is a variant of it, of the Touring version. Uh, the 600i is going through a rework, both the Exploration and the Touring version, because the space used just isn't that good. Um, so look for that, possibly coming out in 2022, and I'm really excited to see what that looks like. Um, and like I said, the 600i, if it's fully manned, fully crewed, everybody on their, their remote turrets and everything, it's a beast in a fight. So it's the 600i, folks. The next ship for Origin we're going to talk about is the 400i. Probably, I think it is the newest ship um, from Origin. It came out at CitizenCon 2951, so last October in the real world. It's kind of a high-performance luxury Pathfinder. Um, it's not really an exploration ship, but it is a Pathfinder, size 2 components. Large ship, a 42 SU of cargo. Um, you can't buy it in game yet, but I think we can buy it in 317. Um, um, about $250 in real life money. Uh, it has a little garage up front. It has like a really long nose. And that the very front of it was going to house the X1 uh, kind of a grav lev bike. And it's that, that little garage is made just for it. It's got like a docking collar. It's got decent defense, a size 3 shield generator. So it can hold its own in a fight, uh, but kind of look at it as a luxury ship, but not a whole lot of space for luxury. It, does, it can accommodate passengers, though. So really cool ship. One of the newest ships. So some of the newest tech has gone into the making of this ship. And lastly, yes, we're not talking about the 300 series, although that's pretty iconic from Origin. Um, I would say watch my Origin videos on the 300 series if you want to know more about that. Let's talk about the starter ship variant of the Origin ships, the 100i, uh, the, one, the 125a, and the 135c. Uh, it's a luxury starter ship. It's made for a single crew member, uh, cargo capacity of like two. I think the, the 135c is cargo of not much more than two. Um, I believe it has four? Uh, six. It has six. So like an Aurora. Um, and the 125a has a uh, souped up weapons package and enhanced thrusters for better speed. Excuse me, better speed. <clears throat> but the 100i, it's really great on hydrogen. It has these cool fuel scoops called the air system. And you're pretty much never going to run out of hydrogen with this ship. You'll run out of quantum fuel, but not hydrogen. So luxury starter ship, uh, eco-friendly, as you, you know, if you take that. Uh, In-game, it goes for about 650000 off of UBC. Real life, it goes for about $50. Well, believe it or not... I actually forgot about Crusader Industries. And so I'm putting this in in post because I have to re-record some stuff. Um, so anyway, guys, let's talk about Crusader Industries. Um, I consider this manufacturer one of the big manufacturers that doesn't have as many ships as, say, RSI or, or, or Anvil or Aegis, but their ships are pretty darn iconic um and we've seen a lot of their ships in the past year and a half or so and uh there's only one ship really that we haven't seen and it's one of the ships i really really want to see um probably i hope next year um anyway crusader industries a real brief history it was founded by this philanthropist named uh august dunlow and um, they own the the gas dwarf planet of Crusader, um, where there is a landing zone, the city in the clouds, um, called Orison, and it's it's actually their shipyard too. It's where they make those ships, and it's one of the ship uh, pl places in game where you can buy ships. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a really cool company. I don't want to get too much into the lore because we also do lore videos and stuff. Um, but, uh, it's a very philanthropic company even today. Uh, but it was really, uh, founded upon the principles of anti measure sentiment, uh, with August Dunlow and, uh, they have some amazingly iconic ships. So let's without, you know, further haste, let's get started. All right. So let's talk about one of my very most favorite ships in the game. Um, the Mercury star runner. Um, it's designed to be kind of a courier ship, uh, you know, made by uh, crusader industries. <laughs> It has a crew of about two to three people. Really, you can you can fly this ship solo, but I think with a crew of two to three, it really, really shines in what it's able to do. Um, I don't really consider this a courier ship uh, per se. I consider this a data running ship, which is, uh, I guess, another word for hacking, although it's the ship should be able to hack things. What it's really doing is storing information in its bank of servers on the inside of the ship. Um, but it does have a special room made just for access to its sensor suite. And um, hopefully I, you're going to be able to hack into things, store that information and then trade that information or sell it uh, both lawfully and unlawfully. Uh, in the future. So that's a pretty cool thing for a ship. Uh, the only other ship that does that right now is the Nomad by Drake or not the Nomad. I'm sorry, the Herald by Drake. Um, but the other real cool thing about the Mercury Star Runner is that it's a smuggler ship. It is the Millennium Falcon, if you will, of Star City as a citizen. Um, it has 114 standard cargo units, but it also has the sub deck below the main deck. And you can actually go in there and kind of crouch down and get to different places on the ship via smuggling ports, I guess would be the right word. Um, and it actually has a section um, inside of it that is shielded cargo. And you can actually put like illegal things in there or whatever you need shielded so they won't be able to be scanned. I don't know if that functionality is necessarily in game yet, but um, it will be for the future. Um, the Mercury Star Runner has a couple of uh, turrets. Uh, I like them. They're really good. Um, size three weapons. And then the pilot has a couple size three weapons. And it comes with uh, decent shields. It has really decent uh, handling and speed. And uh, it, it's, it has a ton of colors. It's one of the most uh, uh, skinned ships in the game. Um, it, it does handle well. It is a little bit bigger ship. So size two components. Um, Fantastic ship. I, I definitely recommend that you check it out if you get a chance. All right. So the next ship from Crusader Industries is the Hercules uh, series of ships. And I say series because there are three types of Hercules out there. Um, we're going to start with the C2 Hercules, uh, which is the civilian heavy transport manufactured by Crusader. Um, it kind of uses uh, its... I guess it has kind of expanding cargo capacity, although I haven't seen anything expand in it. Um, it does have uh, some firepower to it, but really this is just a giant cargo ship. Think of a C5 Galaxy in the real world or a, a Globemaster 3, uh, something like that. Um, it does have the ability to open up both the front and the back, and you'll be able to drive straight through it's the only ship in the game right now that can carry a tank um, and the ballista or the Spartan system. Uh, this variant, the, the C2 variant, is has the most cargo capacity, can carry the most things. Um, but it's really just a giant cargo ship. It does have some habitation space and stuff like that. Awesome ship. Jabba loves it. He calls it his toy hauler. And uh, right now it has the biggest cargo capacity out of any ship in the game until probably the whole series comes online. The next ship in the line is the M2 variant. The M2 is the it's it's got a nickname called Mama Bird. Uh, it is the military version of the Hercules. Um, it is a made to be a vehicle transport uh, and that supports strategic lift and landing operations. Um, 
it is the UEE's premier tactical star lifter. Really, what you're looking for, the difference between the C2 and the M2 is that the M2 has a, a specific gunner station up in the cockpit and it has an extra remote turret um, that on the bottom of the ship that's able to fire straight down. So it, it should be able to, in theory, clear a landing area pretty well. Um, and then it has really close to the same amount of cargo capacity as the C2, but it does have a little bit less due to its extra armor plating. Uh, it sh should be able to last longer in a fight. And it has uh, that extra gun and, and other things. And it's a little more military geared. So instead of civilian habitation stuff, it has an armory and things like that. So I actually own an M2. I really like it. It still fits two tanks. You know, multiple ballistas and stuff like that. So great ship. The last variant is the most expensive variant in the series, the A2 Hercules. And so the A2 Hercules is, yes, it's a cargo ship. It, it can fit a tank in it. It can fit some ballistas in it. But what it's really there for is it's a gunship. Um, so think of like an AC-130. Um, but with a caveat, because this beast can drop the biggest bomb in the game size 10 bombs and those are insane uh they decimate everything and it's it's a privilege to watch them uh when they do when they actually go off sometimes there's there's duds lately um but it is it is designed to go in and uh, clear things out um, drop big bombs, use use their guns to clear out areas and to also carry uh, gear and vehicles and people uh, to get to where they're going. So it is even bigger uh, of a threat um, to ground forces. Um, but it has less cargo than, than the M2 um, because of its giant size 10 bombs in the back. So there we go, a quick down and dirty on the Hercules variants. Okay, so let's talk about the newest really heavy Starfighters in Star Citizen's lineup. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the Ares Ion. Um, it is a purpose-built anti-capital fighter designed <clears throat> to lead the charge against capital ships and heavily armed flotillas. So basically, they took a size 7 gun. And in the Ion's case, it is a laser cannon. And they built a heavy fighter ship around it. Uh, that's the only gun it has. Uh, it does have infinite ammunition, although you only have so many shots per, you know, for the power capacity. But it's it's a beast. Uh, <laughs> when you actually go up against things like hammerheads and interests and things like that, um, it does so much damage uh so it, it it is it is a monster there's been a lot of controversy around the Ares ion it started off being able to actually fight smaller ships um and it would it had the ability to one shot smaller ships like a, an aurora or a mustang and uh cig from what i can gather didn't really like that so they did change the model of the gun they they i they i think reduced the power of the laser itself um, but they increase the fire rate a little bit and then they added in spread, which means as you fire that projectile might not exactly go where your crosshair is, which when you get a bigger ship, it doesn't matter because there's so much area out there, but with smaller ships, much more easy to dodge a size seven, uh, shot coming from an Aries ion. Um, but it's still a, a pretty cool ship. Um, I hope they keep tweaking it and tuning it. And uh, let's talk about the next ship in the line, the Ares Inferno, another purpose built anti capital fighter. Uh, it now, this one is the ballistic version of the Ares, and it's my favorite version. It has a size seven ballistic Gatling gun, and it, they built a ship around it. Um, this ship is <laughs> a monster. Uh, it can kind of go up against like smaller ships like it can actually do a little bit of dog fighting but it is much better geared to go after really large ships um right now in 316.1 and what i suspect for 2022 
we're going to see the keep seeing the increased damage for the ballistics and low ammo counts. And by all means, this, this ship does not have a low ammo count because it, it's the only gun on the ship. Um, but it, it, it has a decent amount of ammo. You could probably do a mission or two before you need to go back and reload. But it just does so much damage with that gun and it tears stuff up. It's a lot of fun to fly. Um, a lot of people... Uh, kind of cross-reference the Inferno with uh, an A-10 Warthog. Uh, a lot of burr, you know, going on. But uh, um, so, yeah, great ship. Uh, cool fighter. Um, the, the newest offerings from Crusader Industries. OK, so let's talk about the last ship in the Crusader lineup. The, the only ship that doesn't exist in game yet. Um, it is called the Genesis Starliner. Um, it is a mid-range passenger spacecraft. Uh, it, its interior can be adapted for a number of roles, uh, like passenger, freight transport. Um, those are those are pretty common. Uh, but it can also have military adaptations, such as troop transports or space warning and control, like an SWAX uh, setup, which in today's terms would be AWACS. Um, uh, there's a lot of big companies out there, like uh, Meridian Transit in the game. They use uh, they have a whole fleet of uh, Genesis Starliners. Um, and they use those to uh, standardize uh, repair processes and lower maintenance costs um, around the verse. Uh, so it is, uh, I guess it includes support for 40 passengers and eight crew. The, cr the crew size is two to eight. Um, it's got a fully modular interior. Um, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about the Genesis Starliner. Uh, we do know it's Jared Huckabee's favorite ship and the one he wants to see in game the most. <laughs> but... Uh, it does have a crew of two to eight, a cargo capacity of about 300 SCU uh, as far as concept goes. Um, it's got medium sized like radars and computers, uh, large power plant, large shield generator, which is a good thing. It's supposed to be uh, one of the most fuel efficient ships for a ship of its size, which I expected to be pretty large, just like a, a real airplane in real life is, is fairly large. Um, I guess like a lot of teams would like a lot of things like racing teams would would have their own Starliner and they would, you know, put their their ship inside that ship to transport it around. Kind of like a tour bus type of thing, I guess, would be a cool role for uh, that ship. Um, and there is actually a special customized version made for the, the UEE Imperator called Imperator One. Kind of like Air Force One. Uh, it features an advanced aerospace prototype test bed, which with offers increased security and uh, added luxury for ferrying in the, si the sitting Imperator and staff to various different off-road visits. So really cool ship. I, I love the concept. I love that one of the professions you're actually going to be able to be a pilot in the game. That's pretty cool, like a professional pilot. Um, so when when I saw the NPC taxi missions get taken out of the 317 roadmap, I was pretty bummed because I know that's step one in getting this ship out the door or at least started. So I'm hoping that we do see it uh, sometime in 2023. Um, I hope we don't have to wait till 2024, but I guess we'll see what the cards show us. And there we go. That concludes uh, Crusader Industries ship lineup. Okay, so now we're going to talk about smaller companies and some of the ships that they have. Um, I went over what I consider the bigger companies in the game. So now we're going to talk about smaller companies. Uh, Al Poa or a Poa, I think I say it as um, literally translates in Gion to the corporation of house Poa. Uh, it is a Gion company. Uh, they make some, some pretty darn cool ships. Um, first one on the screen here is the car to wall. Um, the car to wall is a light fighter. It's really neat because it's probably the most maneuverable ship in the game. It has vectored thrust with all of its engines, main engines in the back. And it actually has some pretty powerful weapons as well. So, um, yeah, Cartuwal, super maneuverable ship. Um, not a ton of armor or shields, but if you can outmaneuver your enemy, you can possibly win the fight. Um, next ship from Apoa is the Gravlev Racer, which is called the Nox. Um, I do have a Nox and I like it. Um, it's it reminds me of kind of like a open canopy crotch rocket type racer. 
zipping through the planets and stuff. It is it is made for racing, um, but it is a, a, a snub ship, if you will. Uh, it, it's made for the ground. <laughs> so uh, that one, it's inspired by humans. Uh, and, you know, there's human variants because Gion are giant ninja turtles. Um, yeah, so the Apoa Nox. Then you have the Santak Yai. I don't know so much about this ship because it's not in the game yet, but it very much looks like the car to all. Um, but it translates to ship that creates genuine fear. So it's supposed to be the medium fighter by for Xion, um, the Xion military uh, made by Apoa. Um, sort of supposed to have new systems, um, things like that. I think it's it actually is in the pipeline to be made at some point, but I don't think we're going to see it until next year, 2023 in real life. Um, yeah, the Sentak Yai, uh, it goes for about 220 bucks, real money. And that is a POA. Let's talk about Argo, the MPUV, the ship of the year. So the MPUV, um, there's two versions of it. Actually, there's three versions of it. Um, but the, the, the Argo Cargo, the MPUVC, um, which stands for Multi Purpose Utility Vehicle, um, it is manufactured by Argo. Uh, it's made. To do light freight, a crew of one, cargo capacity of two. Um, it actually won ship of the year in 2951. A um, little bit of controversy there, but a really cool utility vehicle. It's probably the most used vehicle in the game, really. Um, it's made to ferry things up and down throughout space, and it's made to kind of just do utility stuff and fit cargo in it to do it. So, um, it's probably going to be the ship that takes cargo containers and loads them on other ships type of thing. So think of it as, it, as like a flying forklift, basically. The variants of the MPUV are the MPUV 1P or the personnel version, which is made to ferry people uh, from like a planet to space. There's no quantum drives in these very small ships. So um, pretty cool uh, to have that with... Uh, uh, Argo and, and the Argo Cargo Argo personnel. And then one of the variants that's actually not in the game is the MPUVS, which I'm not sure if that's ever really going to come out, but it's a search and rescue variant of the Argo MPUV. Um, it's supposed to have medical equipment in the back, things like that. And then there's a military variant as well that we'll probably see in Squadron 42. Next ship up we're going to talk about is the Argo Mole. So when we talked about the prospector, now we're going to talk about the mole. The mole is the stands for multi-operator laser extractor, medium sized multi-crew mining ship. Um, it's got three independent mining turrets and uh, good crew facilities. It's got beds and a, and a galley and things like that. So the, the concept here with the mole is a maximum crew of four uh, has 96 cargo units. So quite a bit more than the prospector. But it has three different mining areas, one in the center and two on the outside left, the port and the starboard side, which will actually extend from the ship. So the idea is to have three people in the mining turrets and then someone piloting and the pilot moving around and then the miners mining and extracting. So you could do one giant rock at once or three separate rocks at once or whatever combination of that works. Um, it's you can actually do a lot of solo mining in it as well. You just have to park the mole and then get out, go down to one of the lasers and go and go mine from there. So it also features upgraded mining heads. So it has size two mining lasers on it. Um, it's got bigger shields. It's obviously a slower ship and it has upgraded weapons from the uh, prospector. So there you go, folks, the Argo mole. Next up is one of the, the newest ships in the game, the Argo raft, which stands for reinforced and advanced freight transport <laughs> it is a cargo hauler with a crew of one to two it has 96 scu and the cool thing about the raft is other than it's a cool look with the, the in, very industrial look from argo um is it has three cargo containers uh, 32 scu each and the idea is the raft is supposed to be able to load and unload cargo extremely quickly because of the way of its of its system there that system is not in game yet it's supposed to come in with the cargo refactor and 318. We'll see if that makes it in. Um, but that's the idea with the uh, the Argo raft. Um, but it does have some habitation areas and things like that. So overall, uh, new and a neat ship. Check out my video if you want to learn more. And lastly, one of the ships that's actually in the pipeline now, um, 
The Argo SRV, or the standard recovery vehicle. Jawa calls this his tow truck. Jawa's, Jawa's towing. Um, so it is a tugboat specializing in tugging cargo containers and ships with their tractor beam. They're going to have a giant tractor beam. And you can use that for salvage, repair, piracy, helping ships out of, out of the atmosphere into space, things like that. Whatever you, know, you think a tow truck could do. It's going to have a crew of one, um, cargo capacity of 10 SCU. Um, it's a tugboat. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. It's going to go for about 150 bucks, uh, real money right now, because it is still in concept. Next up, Con Consolidated Outland. There's quite a few ships here, including some of the most iconic starter ships, like we're going to talk about now with the Mustang series. So the Mustang has technically uh, six variants. Um, there is the Alpha variant, which is, you know, your basic... I guess your basic Mustang. Um, it is a light fighter uh, slash light freight. It is definitely made like the Aurora. Uh, it's It's got four SCU, but like the Aurora, it is a, a starter ship, right? The thing about the Mustang is it's much better at fighting than the Aurora is, in my opinion. Uh, it's faster. It turns better. Um, but you can load up a little bit of cargo into it. The downside of the Mustang is you cannot put a cargo box into it easily it's possible with tractor beam but um it's not supposed to be able to be done it's not made to carry boxes it's a single seat fighter type ship there is a variant of the mustang uh the the first variant we'll call the beta which is um more of a pathfinder type ship it does i believe it has bigger fuel tanks not by much but it's made for a single person and the Mustang Beta actually has a crew quarter in it with a bed and a galley and even a restroom in there. And um, but you have to be in the pilot seat before you can turn around and go to that crew quarters area. Um, there's actually room for it in the Mustang Alpha, so I'm not sure why there's even a, a Beta here. Uh, but the Beta goes for $40 as a pledge uh, versus $30 for the Mustang Alpha. Then we have the variant of the Mustang Delta, which is kind of the militia variant of the Mustang. It comes with uh, better armament. Uh, I think it's going to have better armor. Um, it comes with rocket pods by default. So it's supposed to be the better dogfighter and the more military version of the Mustang. Um, $65 standalone price, so significantly more money. Let's talk about the Mustang Gamma, which is the racing variant of the Mustang. Um, again, crew of one, and it has, uh, a larger power plant and an extra main engine, which gives it a little bit better and smoother acceleration and more power, um, to be able to move around. Not much I could say about the Mustang Gamma other than it's, uh, another racing ship. Um, but this time it is the Mustang variant. The other two variants of this is the Mustang Omega, um, which is a ship that you can only... It's a skin of a Mustang Alpha. Um, or I'm sorry, of the, of the Mustang Gamma, uh, the racer. Uh, you can only get it if you pledge, uh, if you pledged back in the day using, uh, I think you had to buy an AMD R9 or something like that, a graphics card. And you got a coupon to get this ship and this skin and Squadron 42, I believe. That's the only way you can get it. Um, and they don't make those graphics cards anymore, so I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can find it on the gray market. And then I believe for the Mustang Alpha, there is a a, a Valiant. Uh, it's the Vindicator, the Mustang Alpha Vindicator, which is a limited edition uh, Alpha with a white livery. So it's a skin uh, commemorating CitizenCon 2948. Um, and it's all about Silas Kerner, who is the CEO of Consolidated Outland. Next up in Consolidated Outland, the supposed to be the premier premium starter ship the consolidated outland nomad which is a light freight ship 24 scu a cargo crew of one it's kind of a multi-purpose freighter type of thing um about half the size of like a millennium falcon right um it's got a kind of a weird angled look to it but it's got some uh, some cool technology it's it's grav lab it doesn't actually land it hovers um but i call it the ford ranger of space Ford Ranger of Star Citizen because uh, the cargo area in the back is open to the air. It does go up and down. It's supposed to lock down when it when the cargo bay's up, but 
you can still tractor beam stuff out even even though it's up and locked so careful with that nomad um, it goes for about 80 bucks standalone yeah, or you can buy it for 952,000 alpha UEC. Next up is the Pioneer from Consolidated Outland. Um, the Pioneer is... Uh, I, I, I don't know if I would ever actually get a, a Pioneer. It's, it's a rare ship. It, I believe it's only sold in limited quantities. Um, but it is for... It's a construction ship, right? It's a construction shipyard. It has self-contained mo uh, mobile construction yard capable of creating modular structures. So think of it as a ginormous 3D printer. Um, it's a capital sized ship. It's going to be huge. 600 SEU of cargo. Um, but we don't we just don't know enough about it for me to say a lot about it. But basically, when you want to build your outpost on some moon or planet somewhere, you're going to you're going to need a pioneer to come 3D print your house basically <laughs> that's what a pioneer is next up let's talk about asperia asperia is a human spacecraft manufacturer that adapts and reproduces and sells existing xeno spacecraft and weapons and designs so it's it's they do a lot of stuff on tavarin um which we're gonna talk about and then they do some vandul um made for human type stuff um so the first one we're gonna talk about here on screen is the prowler which is uh, based off a infamous Tavarin armored personnel carrier. So it's it's a drop ship, right? Um, Asperia's astro engineers were given unmitigated access to study these ships. Um, medium sized ship. Uh, you can buy it in game for about 4 million alpha UEC or about $440 real money. Um, the cool thing about the Prowler is that. It it has uh, when you open the, the side doors for where the dropship people would come out they're actually shielded you can shoot out of them but they're shielded for shots coming in so it actually has really powerful size fives um before the flight model was changed uh last year uh, this actually was a decent ship uh to fight in next up from asperia is the talon and there's two variants of the talon the talon and the talon strike the talon is a light fighter crew of one no cargo it is made just to fight it is a tavarin base design uh, when everything is spread out it kind of looks like uh, wings um, the Talon has directional phalanx shields for maximum maneuverability but it actually has very very weak uh, physical armor once the shields are out uh, the base Talon has uh, a pair of size 4 weapons and size 3 missile rack and then the variant of the Talon is the Talon Shrike which um is the missile boat version of the Talon. Um, it has smaller guns, but it carries way more missiles, like 24 size 3 missiles. Other than that, it's pretty much the same ship design-wise. Um, next up would be the Asperia Glaive. So this is one of the first uh, reproductions of a Vandal ship. Um, the Glaive is a symmetrical version of the Scythe. Right, so the glaives, both sides are symmetrical, uh, reproduced for human use. Um, it's got two huge blade wings uh, uh, where the scythe just has one. It's made for a crew of one. Uh, it is a medium fighter. Um, it's actually a pretty cool fighter. It's got a lot of the red and stuff that go with the Vanduul's type of UI and things like that. Um, next up is the scythe, which we were just talking about. The scythe is... Now, this is a replica, right? Uh, it is a, another medium fighter, a Vanduul fighter manufactured for human use. Um, it, I don't know, it, it, a lot of people really like the scythe and the way it flies. It's got that, just like a scythe, it's got one huge wing area with the, the big cannon on it. The, the What they call the strong cannon, where the other cannon is the weak cannon and the glaive has two strong cannons and those are plasma weapons. So they're designed to do damage over time. And lastly, the Asperia blade, which is another replica of a light fighter from the Vanduul. Think of this as more like a miniature glaive. Um, uh, again, a Vanduul ship, a uh, small, small fighter. Um, I believe it just has weak weapons. It's not very strong. It can be fun to fly. It is very maneuverable. 
Next up, from Kruger Intergalactic, the snub ship that comes with the Constellation Andromeda and the Aquila, the P-52 Merlin. So the Merlin is a really cool design. Uh, Kruger is like a German company. Um, it's very fast, very maneuverable, does not have a quantum drive. So there's not much in it as far as systems go. And it comes with some really hefty uh, ballistics. No cargo, nothing like that. And it's not even a light fighter. It is a snub fighter. So used for a lot of punch. Uh, you could race with it. Um, local reconnaissance and very fast combat. Its cousin is the P-72 Archimedes, which comes with the uh, Constellation Phoenix series. This is more of a luxury version of the Snub Fighter, just like the P-52. Um, exceptional handling, uh, sleek package, crew of one, no cargo. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool ship. You can buy these standalone for like 35 bucks, so pretty neat for the p72 archimedes there's just not that much to talk about um okay next up banu so the banu live in a, a group uh called a suli and it's part of the banu protectorate and then the banu make ships the first ship we're going to talk about here is the banu merchantman uh, it's a trading ship it's huge by the way and that is capable of, of landing or docking and then having locals come in and trade at their kiosks and stuff like that that is that is set up on the merchantman it's going to it's actually being worked on right now uh, it's in white box it's almost in gray box phase so definitely i think we're going to see it in 2022 probably by citizen con um its cargo capacity is 2800 scu crew of four to eight it's a heavy freight ship uh you can pick up the ship for about 550 dollars um it's gonna be pretty darn cool um Again, it's it's made for, to be social. It's made to carry a lot of goods. It's going to have that bazaar. It's going to have like a, a negotiation room. It's going to have some really big weapons, actually. And uh, I'm excited to see it when it comes out. Next up from the Banu is the, the ship that's made to go with the Merchantman, the Banu Defender. Um, a, a cool ship. It's a it's a crew of two, but you can solo this. Um, there's made to be one person sitting on each side of it. Um, it's So it's a two-seat combat ship. It does have living quarters and things like that. It's the only light fighter in the game that has big enough quantum tanks where you could put a VK-00 quantum drive, the fastest military drive, and it can go across the system with it. So that's rare in a light fighter, um, but it's able to do that. Um, so it has Xeon thrusters and then Tavaring shields, and it has Singed Tachyon cannons. Um, they used to have these hit scan weapons that as soon as you shot them, they immediately hit. There was, there was infinite speed to it. Um, while they weren't that powerful, they couldn't really dodge your shots. The, it, it automatically hit. And so they took that out and they're, they're still working on those type of weapons. Um, very alien interior, very alien quantum travel. You'll have to try that out. Next up, let's talk about Gatak, which is there's only one ship. It's a new manufacturer. Uh, last year, they came out with the Raylan. It is not actually in game yet, um, but it will be at some point. The Raylan is a cargo ship of about 320 SCU of cargo, crew of one to four. Um, it is a Xeon ship, which translates to smooth, peaceful cargo. Um, it's going to have grab lift technology. Uh, living spaces, kind of a unique cargo hold, and, a, and an adaptable cockpit. So if we ever have Xeon in the game, they'll also be able to fly and use the Raylan. So I don't know that much about the ship, uh, and I don't want to get into it too much, but it looks really cool. Okay, vehicles. Let's talk about vehicles. First off, the Anvil Ballista. So the Ballista is part of what's called the Atlas system by Anvil. Um, it's the Ballista and the Spartan. They're kind of on the same chassis. And the Ballista is basically missile defense, or it's anti-air vehicle, and it's made to shoot to use size 7 missiles to shoot down incoming air targets. Its cousin, the armored personnel carrier, or the, or the infantry fighting vehicle, the Anvil Spartan, is more to carry people around um, as a carrier to get them from point A to point B on the ground. Um, it does come with weapons and stuff like that, but it's more armored and it's more to carry people around. 
Next up is the Origin G12 Rover. Um, again, this is this is a, 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 a car, right? Think of it as a futuristic car. Um, but it's made. It's some of them have weapons. There's variants. There's the standard variant, uh, the military variant, and I believe a like a cargo variant. But uh, this stuff is. It, this is an older vehicle. It's been around for a few years since they went on sale. There has been no mention of it ever being um, even close to production. So I just don't want to get too much into the rover, but Origin does have a vehicle. Then there's the RSI Ursa Rover. This this vehicle is in game. Um, it's one of the cooler vehicles out there. It's it's made to have more than one crew in there, um, but it's made to be like if you're going to go explore a moon somewhere, this is the rover you want to take. Um, it, it, it's a very sturdy. It has eight wheels. Um, it moves around fairly slow, but it is like I said, sturdy. It does have a weapons package and it has other amenities inside the Ursa Rover. Next up is the golf cart, the Grey Cat PTV. Um, Grey Cat, yeah. Uh, so this, like I said, there's nothing much to the PTV. It is a golf cart, but a lot of people got free PTVs with uh, referrals. And yeah, there you go, the Grey Cat PTV. Next up from Grey Cat is the Rock and the Rock DS. The Rock stands for Remote or Collector, and DS stands for Dual Seat. So the Rock is the ground vehicle that you can use to go mine. Um, you can't mine rocks that a ship would mine. You have to find, they look like little gems is what you want to mine with the Rock. And uh, with the, the regular Rock, it is a single player only version um, with, with smaller cargo bay than the DS. Um, but you can mine stuff and, and suck it up and then park your rock in a ship and fly it to a different place and then um, trade out that stuff and, and get money. The DS, a little bit bigger cargo, and it's made for to have a driver drive around. And then the, the, the guy that's in the mining seat will be able to move the mining seat around and actually mine the rocks. So it works. It works pretty good as a team, but it is, you know, I think it's a little bit of a marketing ploy um, to just make another version of the ship and make it make money. Next up is the Tumbril Cyclone. Tumbril. Tumbril is pretty neat. Um, they are their headquarters is I say um, they make what I call it is the Warthog from freaking uh, 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 Halo. But it is kind of the all terrain uh, vehicle. Um, there is a base model just called the Cyclone. Um, it features kind of an open flatbed in the back where cargo pieces can be put uh, to transport. Um, there's the AA version or the anti-air version. Um, it comes equipped with surface to air missiles as countermeasures to provide a cover for ground troops against airborne targets. There's the Cyclone MT, which is the ground vehicle in the Cyclone series that is designed around a two person ground combat against air and ground targets. So it has missiles. And it has a turret that the person in the back can fire. Um, the missiles are size two, um, and the cannon is a size one. It's it's my favorite cyclone out of all of them. There is the cyclone RC, which is the racing variant. Yes, everybody has a racer, right? Um, it has control bursts of speed, kind of like afterburner, and uh, better handling than the base cyclones. There's the cyclone RN, which is a reconnaissance vehicle. Um, it is kind of, it's, it's made for scouting runs, fast detailed scans of the terrain. It can place beacons and it has an EMP device, but no other weapons. And then the, lastly, the Cyclone TR, which is basically stands for turret is uh, designed for militia and security use. That's a uh, human operated turret in the back, a 360 degree field of fire with a size one weapon. Next up from Tumbrel is the Nova, the Nova Tonk, basically, or the tank. Uh, it's a fully comprehensive battle tank, uh, reimagined kind of for the modern age, it's a size five uh, giant ballistic tank weapon, and it can one shot some very small fighters. Um, it also has a ballistic turret on the top as well, and it does move like a tank. Uh, it has tracks and those tracks can move independently from each other. So a uh, pretty cool to control that, um, and it's awesome to actually have a tank in the game. And then there's the the Rangers. <laughs> the Rangers. I love them. They're motorcycles. Um, they're a variant. Uh, there's different variants of it. The CV variant is focused on endurance range and uh, being a courier. Um, 
They're supposed to have really cool tires and supposed to be a little bit more uh, maneuverable. The Ranger RC, of course, is the racing variant. Uh, so it's going to be the Croc Rocket version of the Ranger. Um, it's going to have speed. Uh, it's going to be made for racing. Probably, a, a, you know, it'll be able to turn better, better steering, better braking. And then lastly, the Ranger TR, which is the firepower and combat focus, the turret version. Um, so that'll be able to actually shoot down uh, different targets with that version of the Ranger. All right, let me cut in here real fast, guys, before we end this out. There is a late entry into the uh, ground vehicle manufacturer market, and that is Consolidated Outland with the Consolidated Outland Hover Quad. Um, it's brand new to 3.16.1, and uh, I did a whole video on it, uh, like a first look, and it's a pretty fun vehicle. Um, there's no weapons or shields on it, but there's a little bit of storage, so you definitely have the possibility to um, hold things if you go out hand mining or something like that. But um, yeah, it, it just recently came out, so if you're interested in that bike, uh, go ahead and check it out from Consolidated Outland. Okay, let's talk about the Van Duel. First off, the Van Duel Kingship, the largest ship in the game. Um, that we know of right now. Um, it is a carrier ship. It could have a crew of up to 1,400 giant, nasty-looking Van Duel. Um, the flagship of the Van Duel clans, it's a dreadnought, a fleet carrier, command and control ship, and an assault transport combined into a single hull. I mean, it's just huge. We're talking 3,000 meters long, so it's three times the size of a Bengal carrier. No wonder the Van Duel killed everybody. <laughs> So uh, they're pretty rare. We don't know that much about them, but there you go. Vandal Kingship. Probably fight those in Squadron 42 at some point. Then there's the Vandal Harvester. So there's there's two different types of harvesters. There is the ground vehicle, which recycles all forms of matter into an unknown biological resource, which is the foundation of the Vandal technology uh, used for strip mining. Then there's the Harvester Carrier, which is a transport vessel with massive engines capable of atmospheric flight, and it deploys harvesters during a raids to harvest their resources. So the Vandal are going to come, they're going to take all of our resources, convert them into slugs that they use to make other Vandal stuff, and they have a ship that carries them. Pretty wicked. The Vandal Stinger. All right, it is a heavy fighter, a crew of one to three. It's going to be for Squadron 42. Don't know that much about it uh, other than it's one of the heavy fighters of the Vanduul. And uh, the Vanduul Void, the last ship we're going to talk about in this PowerPoint here, um, it is a heavy bomber ship that is able to launch a number of missiles, torpedoes, uh, bombs, and, and boarding craft towards the target. Um, again, don't know that much about it. It's going to be part of Squadron 42. It is a large ship. Um, I'm sure there's going to be more, uh, more to come on the void. And that wraps it up folks for the, I guess the PowerPoint section of talking about some ships. Hope I haven't talked your ear off on this too much. I know it was long, but I hope you were able to glean some information from it. And we'll see you in the next section when we start talking about ASOP terminals. Okay, everybody. So we're going to quickly talk about the ASOP terminals, which is what is here. We're at our corp. And we're going to pull out one of our vehicles. Uh, we're going to go up to the vehicle retrieval console, hold down F and click on left click to use. So here you can see all of our vehicles here, the vehicle name, the information of where it's stored or something like that. Uh, the, the location of the vehicle, all these vehicles, because I just started a, uh, the account over. Um, it is an Area 18. Um, the status of the ship, the focus of the ship, what kind of ship it is. Uh, the cargo does not give accurate information, so do not believe that, or the crew. Um, and the tracking button does not work, um, but the retrieve button works. So let's say I wanted to pull out something. Let's say the, the Anvil Carrick. Um, well, here's the Anvil Carrick. It's stored. It's an Area 18. Uh, it's an expedition ship. It says Crew of Six. That's probably fairly accurate. But if I want to retrieve it, I just click on the retrieve button here. 
It's going to tell me to wait while the vehicle is being delivered to the platform. It's going to be in a hangar because the hangar. Well, I'm I'm on I'm, I'm on land, so everything's going to be in a hangar. But sometimes ships are small enough they'll spawn on a pad instead of a hangar, and it's going to be in hangar seven. You notice I have a little marker on my screen here that tells me Anvil Carrick, Hangar 7. So when I get to the elevators and go to Hangar 7, that's where my ship is. If I come back into the ASOP terminal and I go back down to the Anvil Carrick, we can see that it is on a pad, which really it's in a hangar, in Hangar 7. And that my actions here are to store the ship. And so I can go ahead and click Store. And it will store the ship. Boom. So the marker is gone. It's stored. It's at area 18. If now, now the cargo is accurate, right? 456. If my ship does get destroyed, um, it will tell me, hey, the status of the ship is destroyed. And it will tell me where it's destroyed at. So some, something like, say it's a moon, like Lyria of our corp. It'll just say, it'll say Lyria and it'll say destroyed. And then at that point, I could come over here and instead of clicking retrieve, there'll be a claim button. When you click claim, it'll take you to a timer and it'll tell you how much time it, it will take to actually claim the ship. Uh, and then you can click claim. Right now, there really is no insurance model in the game. So everything has insurance. Um, I don't know how that's going to work in the future, and I really don't want to speculate on it. But I know if you actually buy a ship with real money, you'll always be able to claim it. You'll always be able to get another ship. That function will never change. There's just a time penalty, basically. You do also have the option of expediting a claim. Uh, it does cost off a UEC. It costs money in game. But you can speed up the speed of your claim uh, sometimes by half. Other times, it'll be instant. You'll be able to instantly claim your ship. So just think about that next time uh, you have the ASAP terminal, and that's what those buttons mean. All right, guys, so this is uh, the first ship store that you're probably going to see in game, especially if you start at Lordville. I believe it's actually the biggest ship store in game. It is called the New Deal Shipyard, and it is at Lordville on Planet Hurston. As you come up towards the ASOP terminals and the elevators to the hangars, you'll see that uh, there's an M50 up here. That's uh, such a cool looking ship. And uh, it, it's kind of parked here on this glass um, area. And you can actually, if you're time it right, you can hop the glass. Yeah. And then you can you can actually get in the ship. Um, you can hop up on the wings. You can do stuff. And more importantly, uh, you need to hop back. Like, OK, there we go. More importantly, you can actually buy it. And so if I if I hover with my F key over here, my interaction key and I click buy, It'll pop up a thing in the Moby, and I can actually purchase an M50 with in-game credits for 1.1 million Alpha UEC. But there's much more to show you. When you hit New Deal, um, you kind of come up to this showroom, and it's got some some cool gold models and things like things you can't buy over here. There you go. Guy has super deep voice. It's probably Space Tomato. Did some moonlighting over there. <laughs> uh, but when you actually come into, um, it says now leaving Archimedes Flight, which is probably this terminal. You come around to the back here. You see some cool pictures of ships. And now we're actually coming up to the shipyard. And we're going to go explore those. Those are actually ships you can get in and kind of walk around and two of them are actually really big ships but we're going to come in the actual uh there's a player right there the the ship section where you would actually buy a ship in the game um flanking the ship store itself is another m50 that you can buy um and when you come in it's it's kind of a cool little it's like, it looks like a car sales room right then there's this guy hey it's same voice so I'll call that Cobra <laughs> with Cobra TV because it's a white dude with a super deep voice. Um, over here is the Origin uh, 85X Limited. Um, you could get in this ship. You could buy it right here for about half a million Alpha UEC. Um, here is a different version of the Aurora. This is the Aurora LX. Um, they, they have very subtle differences, but pretty much all the Auroras are very similar to each other. And of course, over here is the infamous Misk Prospector. 
So we're going to wait for this guy here who's at the kiosk uh, to finish his business. Um, while we do that, we can we can see the Misk Prospector here. And um, yeah, you can get in and kind of explore the ship a little bit. It goes for about two million Alpha UEC. Um, but one of the things you can do in the shipyard here, especially, is if you can... Ah, there we go. Enter ship. Ladder will come down. And that guy just bought a ship at the ship terminal. So we can come in here and we can actually explore the prospector a little bit. We can actually sit down on the bed and we can check, uh, you know, the different interactables in the game. Like in here is the space toilets and the shower and, um, you know, the chair uh, to, to do different things on. So uh, this is where you actually do your mining and we'll, we'll go down at the bottom and See if this thing actually has a mining head on it. To exit the ship, we will open the doors. And we'll just kind of jump out. Yeah, this thing does actually have a mining head on it. Um, it comes with an Arbor size one mining laser, and that's what this guy is. So pretty cool that we can see that and uh, enjoy that while this guy is still shopping there is only one kiosk here which is kind of a downside of this place this dude's probably buying like 20 ships so we'll go take a look down here at some of the ships you can explore at new deal um to your left immediate left in the yellow and blue is the mustang beta um this is the mustang that actually has some living space in the back and yes just like the other models you can uh you can actually uh, get up into this ship. Like if we enter the pilot canopy, you, s you can sit at the ship. I believe, let me see if you can stir, still turn power on. I believe you can. Yes, yeah, so we can turn power on. We can't start the engines. Um, but one of the cool things about the Mustang Beta is if we go over here, we can exit to the rear. And it's one of the starter ship series that actually has a cool little bed and a kitchenette and uh, it actually has a space toilet in here as well so pretty cool you can check that out with the mustang beta and then you actually have to get back into the pilot seat turn around and then when you go to the left to exit the ship um, then you'll actually hop out of the ship itself so there's actually two other ships here at New Deal, and they're some very big ships. This, this I'm not going to show you. I'm going to let you explore that in the game. But that is the Constellation Phoenix, and uh, it's the luxury version of the Constellation, my favorite of the Constellations. And um, this actually used to be like open air out here and uh, used to get a lot of windstorms and stuff. But now it's been closed off. There's there's better lighting. There's like this big uh, glass ceiling over here. And yeah, you can get on that constellation. You can go hang out in it. And this is the uh, Aegis Hammerhead, one of the sub capital ships in the game. But it's also one of the biggest ships in the game right now. It's got these huge uh, four gun uh, fighter like picket. It's a picket ship for fighters, and so it's got these huge manned turrets. This is actually a manned turret, and they actually articulate and move around, and uh, it's a really big ship on the inside. It's a size 3 components, size 3 pretty much everything, and it's got a cargo bay, cool engine room, things like that. And look, up in the middle, it's open. And then like a hammerhead shark, which is what it's named after, it kind of has that really cool hammerhead appearance this this down here is actually the cockpit in there and you can buy one of these for just 12 and a half million alpha uec in game so <laughs> you know where to go if you want to buy an Aegis hammerhead let's go check and see if this uh, gentleman is done with his ship purchases it looks like he is and we'll go uh take a look at the kiosk and see some of the different ships that you can buy here at loreville as we come into the area, we'll go into the kiosk. And you can see my Mustang Beta, the Hammerhead, uh, the 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 Connie Phoenix, all the Mustang Alpha, the Avenger Stalker, the Avenger Titan, the Avenger Warlock, the Aegis Eclipse, the Stealth Bomber in the game. Doesn't that look cool? That's an awesome looking ship. Size 9 torpedoes on that baby. And it's stealth. 
Uh, the Aegis Gladius as a fighter, the Aegis Reclaimer, which is a big Salvage ship. Salvage not in the game yet, but we're hoping in 2022 it does come out. So this may be a ship that you want to uh, eventually purchase. It's not going to be able to do Salvage when it comes Salvage comes out, but eventually it will. The Aegis Retaliator, a big heavy bomber. Again, size 9 torpedoes on this, and it's a multi-crew ship. This will be one of the very first ships that has modularity. Uh, the Age of Saber, uh, an actual stealth fighter, laser gun, laser weapons and stuff. Hey, a ground vehicle, the Tumbrel Cyclone anti-air version. A uh, heavy fighter, the Vanguard Warden, the Vanguard Hoplite, a, a heavy dropship. Uh, the, Mis the Misk Freelancer, one of the iconic starter ships uh, <laughs> in this wireframe. But it actually has a lot of cargo. It's got some cool weapons on it. Um, it's got a man turret in the back. Um, the Freelancer Duration, or Dur, the Endurance, basically. The Freelancer Max, the biggest Freelancer with much more cargo than the, than the standard Freelancer, and it can fit more vehicles in the back. Freelancer Missile Boat, the Miss. Uh, the Misk Razor, the racing ship by Misk. Uh, the Reliant Core, which is a lot of people love the Reliant series. You can buy those here at New Deal. The Misk Starfare, the first ship-to-ship -ship refueling uh, vessel. Um, so kind of like that DC-10 Strata tanker uh, from the Air Force. Um, it's actually a pretty cool ship. It needs a lot of work and a lot of polish. Uh, the Starfire Gemini, a variant of that ship that has a bunch of missiles up front. Um, the uh, quintessential Aurora ships, the Aurora ES and the Aurora MR, your, your possible starter ship. The Constellation Andromeda, the Constellation Aquila, Tumbrel Cyclone, the Cyclone Racing version. The Cyclone Scouting or Reconnaissance version, the RN, the Tumbrel Cyclone with a turret in the back. It's got a ballistic turret. The Anvil Ballista, the the uh, armored uh, missile. It has size 7 missiles and it shoots down anti air targets, so it's an anti-air vehicle. Origin 85X that we saw inside, the, the Aurora LX that we saw inside, the Origin M50 racing ship, the Miss Prospector single-player miner ship. The Vanguard Harbinger. See how many ships there are here? It's crazy. The uh, the EMP version of the Vanguard, the Vanguard Sentinel. The Harbinger is the heavy fighter with the size 5 torpedoes. The RSI Mantis, which we'll get into a little bit. The, uh, this has the, the only ship in the game with a quantum interdiction device, meaning it can pull other ships out of quantum travel. Um, the Argo Mole, one of my favorites. This is the multi-crew miner. It has uh, three different mining stations, and it's made for uh, a really a crew of four. Pilot being in there, and then three miners. Uh, the Misk Reliant Mako, the Reliant Sen, and a lot of people's favorite, the Reliant Tana, the missile boat version of the Reliant series. These are This is one of the transformer type of ships. Um, the, right now the wings are horizontal, but they do flip around to be vertical. Kind of looks like a B-wing from Star Wars. The Grey Cat Rock, the, the, the remote ore collector, the, the mining vehicle. Starter ships, the Origin 100i, Origin 125a. The ship of the year, the Argo MPUV Cargo. So, so many here. The Argo MPUV Personnel, the Drake Buccaneer, Drake Caterpillar, awesome ship, cargo ship. The Drake Cuddy Black, Drake Cuddy Blue, the Drake Cuddy Red, the Drake Dragonfly, Grav Lev, uh, speeder bike type thing. The Drake Herald, uh, one of the data runners in the game. Look how big those engines are in the back. The uh, uh, RSI Aurora CL, the Aurora LN, the Legionnaire version with the more missiles. The Consolidated Outland Nomad, the most premium starter ship in the game, 28 SCU. It's the Ford Ranger in the back of the ship. It's got three size three weapons on it. It has really cool living spaces on it as well. Um, this, a lot of people don't like this ship, especially as a starter ship, because it's rather expensive as a starter ship. But I think it's actually pretty cool. It's got some really cool uh, technology to it. I know you can't see it in this wireframe model, but there's like a pickup uh, pickup truck bed in the back. The Rock Dual Seat. The Tumbrel Nova. The Tonk. The Tank. And this thing isn't rendering in, but this is the tank. You'll see it. Uh, you've probably already seen it when we talked about ships. Um, the Hercules M2 Starlifter. Weird that it's here. Are the, and finally, the last ship, the RSI Constellation Taurus, the, probably the newest ship added to this. The cargo variant of the Constellation series, the one without a snub fighter, but secure cargo in the back. So, whew, that was a lot to talk about. That are the, those are the ships that are available at the New Deal Shipyard at Lorville. Uh, let's move on to Astro Armada at Area 18.
All right, guys. So here is the shipyard at Area 18 um, in the Arc Corp planetary system. It is called Astro Armada. It sells a variety of ships. It used to be very anvil centric, um, but nowadays with the addition, uh, with the removal of Levski and their ship shop and the addition of Orison and the Crusader showroom, they sell different ships here now. So things you can buy here at one of the kiosks is the Anvil Hawk, Orchid 300i, 315p, 325a, the Anvil Arrow, the M50, the Gladiator, um, the Hornet series, um, including the Super Hornet, the Tracker, the Hornet Ghost, the Anvil Hurricane, the it's very Anvil-centric still, the Terrapin, the Valkyrie. You can buy the Consolidated Outland Mustang Delta, the Gamma, the Kruger P-52 Merlin by itself. Origin 350R, the 600i, um, the Apoa Knox, the Cartuol, awesome ship. Uh, the Ballista, the Carrick. You see, I don't even have money for the Carrick. It's 26 million off of UVC to buy the Carrick in game. But it is possible. The Bandit Defender, the 600i Touring, the Asperia Prowler, um, the 100i type ships, the regular Hornet, the Grey Cat PTV. Talons, um, Miss Grazers, the eight you can buy the 890 jump here. It costs 32 million off of UVC. And then you can also, for some reason, buy the Crusader C2 Hercules here. So a ton of different options to be able to buy ships. You can also segregate. I don't know why under RSI we have Grey Cat, but uh under Origin is like Origin ships, under Kruger is Kruger, Solid Outland, etc. So this is one of the ship shops, and it is at uh, area 18 called Astro Armada. All right, everybody. And here we are at the final ship showroom. Uh, we're here at Orison at uh, the house that Dunlow built at Crusader Industries and the Crusader Industries headquarters and ship showroom. Let's go make our way inside. Look at the, uh, the cool model of the C2 out front here. With the flags blowing in the wind. When we first uh, come up here, we are greeted by this gentleman with some actual pretty, pretty cool, uh, sh pretty cool shirt, pretty cool jacket. I want to be able to get a hold of one of those. Huh. I haven't seen those available in game. Right now we're in the foyer. And we are going to go ahead and take an elevator to the showroom, which is a little different. Um, the founder of Crusader, August Dunlow, which the spaceport is named after here, is uh, was a very big philanthropist. And we can see here, uh, just in the in the lobby area, is a kind of a cross section of a C two Hercules, and they do have interactive uh, displays and things like that here. Oh. There we go. It's going to uh, it's going to open up and I show you different parts around that ship. And believe it or not, those hoses and the piping and all that stuff, that's that's actually like real things. Like when we have this uh, life support systems in there, air is actually going to go through there. Um, coming up and straight in front of us is the showroom. But uh, to the there is a uh, like a yard bar and there's a corporate side here as well see the really cool looking uh i guess they're pistons holding <laughs> holding that up um there is a showroom bar here and it shows uh pictures there's there's august dunlow himself founder of crusader industries um and some other important people in the crusader uh, family and of course here you know as a bartender you can actually get a drink and everything and uh, hang out and take a look at ships um, looks like they also have some weapons here as well. Like this is a light strike cannon and, uh, yeah, you can, you can buy this here guys, <laughs> the light strike six, but right up here is, uh, this bad boy, uh, <laughs> the Mercury star runner available in the ship showroom here. Um, and if you want it, you just have to kind of run up to it and then you can click buy it sells for 4.9 million. Alpha UEC, one of the coolest ships in the game. You can even get inside of it and play around with it. And, you know, take take a look at it. Over here, for, see, there's not much here. Right now, there's just a C2 uh, Hercules. That's probably why 
the M2 is available to buy at Lorville because it's not here on the showroom floor um, here at Orison. And then there's... Oh, well, here's the elevator for the C2 right here. Um, so you'd be able to you'd be able to actually go into the C2 and you'd be able to check it out and look around it and explore that. And I'll leave that awesome thing up to you unless you want to go check out my ship review on the Hercules series. Um, hopefully we'll get uh, soon. We will get the Ares Starfighters in here. These actually are in game, both the Ares Ion and the Ares Inferno. Um, but they always wait a full patch cycle from a new ship before they actually make it available in game. So, um, 317, we should see the Ares Ion and the Ares Inferno in there, uh, available to buy at, uh, the Crusader showroom. Now here is the sales Hi. stuff, Hi. sales people. And I, yeah, we can't really interact with them, although she's very friendly. And here we have one of the famous uh, T-posing bugs of uh, our NPCs in Star Citizen. <laughs> Look at this guy looking at me. Yeah, okay. Um, but there's no kiosks here. There's no terminals or anything uh, to be able to buy anything. The showroom is sort of incomplete. Um, but hopefully, you know, it'll things will get added to it as, as, as we go along and more ships get added. Um, over here in the corner is just a kind of cool collection of pictures. There is the Hercules M2, uh, fitting two Tonks and some other ships. Um, these are actual, you know, images that uh, C uh, CIG has done with, with these ships, and they put them in game, and that's pretty amazing. There's a Mercury Star Runner, MSR over there, a bunch of different Hercules and so very much like any other car car uh, showroom. Um, and there we go. That is the Orison slash Crusader uh, ship showroom. There's, there's only two ships available there right now. But it's also the only place, I believe, where you can purchase uh, Mercury Star Runner. So, all right, folks. So we are going to start talking here about... Uh, the new player guide for the ship components in the game. <clears throat> I don't want to delve too far down the rabbit hole in, in this because you can certainly get lost. But let's get started. Um, so first up, we need to talk about the type of ship components. Customization of ships is a huge part of this game, and I think a lot of people find it very interesting and fun to try the different types of combinations. Uh, it used to be much more customizable last year, earlier last year, before a lot of things were changed around for uh, an ongoing rebalance. But we'll get into that as we go along. But basically, the uh, really the four main types of things in a ship that you can change currently are your ship systems, some systems, uh, your missiles, your guns, and your paint. So for ship systems, um, bespoke items. There are some ships that have bespoke uh, guns and missiles, but all ships right now, you are not able to change out any type of thrusters, engines, EMP devices, electromagnetic pulse, or QEDs, which is a quantum enforcement device. Thrusters is what allows the spacecraft to, to go up and down, left and right, like to strafe, right? And it, allows for a different type of flight model than what we, you know, what we have currently on Earth, which, you know, you usually put your engines in the back or your propellers in the front, and you're either pushing or pulling, but you don't have thrusters that let you go faster in a certain axis. I mean, like left and right, up and down, and the Z, X, Y, and Z axis. This flight model is a little bit different, you, but you can't change those out. I believe in the future you will be able to change those out. Same thing with engines. 
right now with ship engines, um, and we're talking main engines. We're not talking power plants. We're talking engines. It's a little bit different. Um, so for the engines, there there was supposed to be, I think, in 316, but the car got removed from the roadmap. We were supposed to be able to swap out the engines in an Origin M50, um, and that's basically the first test of modularity, but that got taken off because CIG is nowhere near ready for uh, modularity. Um, but we will be able to swap engines and things out um, once that tech is available to do. Um, EMP devices, right? These are size devices, and, and they're only on certain types of ships that even have EMP capability. And so the EMP device for that size for that ship is for the most part bespoke can't change it out because there's nothing to change it out with um, quantum enforcement device. There's only one ship right now that has a QED and that's the RSI Mantis where it actually pulls other ships out of quantum travel. Um, there, there's only one device that exists for that. And so there's nothing to change it out with. And then certain ships have guns and missile racks that you cannot change anything on. For instance, uh, the Constellation series has um, two guns uh, that I believe are on the top of the ship uh, that are pilot controlled, but they are uh, size four gimbaled. And you cannot change. You can change the type of gun that goes on there, but you can't change the hard point. Meaning you can't change the fact that that gun must be a size four. It can't be a size three. It can't be a size five, even though the hard point's a size five. It must be a size four. The Freelancer is a good example. You have to have size threes for the pilot control guns. There is no other choice. So that's a version of bespoke for the hard point. Um, there are some ship's guns that you can't change anything on so for instance the the uh, Ares Ion and the Ares Inferno those size 7 guns are fixed there's no other size 7 guns to swap it out with but you couldn't swap out the Ion's laser cannon with the Inferno's ballistic repeater even though they're both size 7 those are bespoke guns um, same thing is true with some ships and missile racks for instance again the Constellation you ha you have a certain type of uh, size of missile racks and you can't change them out. So the only thing you could fit in there is, let's say, size two missiles. You can change the type of missiles that go in there, whether they're, you know, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, you can't change the size of them. So that's kind of where the bespoke stuff comes in. So let's talk about the class of the item. Um, <laughs> there are five different classes. The first one being uh, military class. Uh, the military class is supposed to be what the military uses. And some of those classes of items are sold uh, usually at different places around Stanton. Um, we used to kind of have much better shopping, ease of shopping. But right now, everything is actually really spread out, and it kind of forces you to travel around the system to pick up different components. Um, we have civilian grade, uh, I, I say civilian class of components, <clears throat> which are made for, you know, mostly civilian models of ships. Um, they are, I would say, the most average. Military is usually the highest quality, but there's some kind of trade off there, usually for military. Civilian, I would say, all around is the most average. Um, military components will wear down faster than any other component. Um, civilian components, like I said, most just on average, everything's decent on average. Industrial components are made to last a really long time, but their performance is usually not that good. Um, sometimes they're, they're really, really good, but... Typically, you would have a lower performance, but more duration on industrial components. And this all ties into repair costs as well. The, the, the more wear your part gets, the more often it's going to need maintenance before it fails. And then it costs you more money. Um, 
competition parts. Th these are more for like racing ships and things like that. They usually have high burst performance. They don't have good long-term performance and they're usually not necessarily the, the highest performance. Usually military is, but, uh, it's interesting with, with competition stuff. And, and we just, we don't have enough balancing going on yet to really need to use competition stuff. We used to, but not, not anymore. And then finally there's stealth components. These components are not necessarily great performers, um, nor are they long lasting or anything like that. But what they have is they are specifically designed to have a low, um, electromagnetic emission EM and, and possibly have a low IR or infrared emission. And so you become more stealthy, um, when people are trying to detect you, whether they're using active or passive radar. Um, so that's, that's kind of where stealth components come in. If and I don't want you to get confused, if you use stealth components on a ship that is not designed for stealth, it's not going to, it's going to make a tiny bit of difference, but not a lot. So if you, you're out there with a hammerhead and you have stealth components installed, well, cool. They'll still be able to detect you 10, 15, 20 kilometers out. Um, you might save a kilometer of detection range, but your, your, your ship is so big and it's pushing so much energy. Stealth components aren't going to help. But when you're in an Aegis Eclipse and you're flying around and you don't have stealth components, you need to get to a certain range so you can launch missiles and you don't want them to see you. Um, if you don't have stealth components, they're probably going to see you coming in. So there's there's a whole trade off of that. And, I, and I've done some videos on that and I don't want to get too into it in a starter guide. Let's talk about the next one. It's the grade of the item. This stuff used to matter a lot more. Um, it still matters today, but the grade of the item, obviously a being the best grade B, C and D. So you're going to have, let's say for instance, a quantum drive, um, and it's going to be a grade a, which is going to be the best quantum drive. And then it's going to have a class, whether it's military or industrial or civilian. And then B would be the next grade down and then C and then D. So you, you know, and, and this really the grade of the item is the performance, the higher, the grade of the item, the better it performs and the more it costs uh, most times there's still balance issues. <clears throat> so let's actually talk about ship systems. First thing we're going to talk about is shields, um, size one and two ships. They currently have bubble shields. And this changed last year because it used to be every ship had facing shields, which means you have a forward uh, facing is forward, back, left and right. And then the shields overlapped in 3D space. That's how everything used to be. But way back in the day, everything used to have bubble shields, too. So <clears throat> so yeah, you changed it and they have made all ships that have size one or size two shield generators, those shields would work as a bubble. And what that means is they don't have any type of facings. The the entire shield shares the same shield. For I'm not sure if I'm explaining this right. If you have a facing shield, you have four separate shields, even though you may only have one shield generator. If you have a bubble shield, it's one overall shield. So if someone is shooting you from the top, it's damaging the entire shield. If someone's shooting you from the bottom, same thing. If both people are shooting you from the top and the bottom, that shield's going to go down real fast. Um, and typically this is fighters, um, a little bit smaller ships, um, like a Cutlass Black or something like that would have a size two shield, but it would be a bubble shield. Um, so that's type of shield uh, size three plus uh, three or higher. Every shield after size three is a facing shield. So a constellation series actually has two. I believe it's two uh, size three shields. And that just means it has more shielding, which we'll get to at the end with the HP pool. But there's overall, there's 100 percent shielding, but the front is 25 percent. The back is 25 percent left and right are 25 percent each. And that means 
that shield is it, it wears down as it gets hit, but it doesn't wear down the other facing sides of the shields. So if you are a smaller ship attacking a larger ship that has a size three plus shield, if you wear down the entire, let's say the right side of the shield, then you're still, once the shield is gone, you're attacking the hull at that point in a bubble shield. It doesn't matter what angle you take the, the shield all goes down at once. Uh, and then there are some ships out. There's only one ship we can fly right now that has a capital class shield. And that is the 890 jump, the, the super space yacht. But a lot of ships in the game that are capital class, they will have capital class shields, something like an Idris or a Kraken or a Liberator, the A90 jump. There's a, there's a bunch of ships out there with it. And those uh, shields are bespoke. You cannot change those shields out. They come with the ship and they stay with the ship. They still have to be repaired, but they're integrated into the ship in a way that you cannot replace them. And then the way shields work right now is there is a hit point pool, basically. And the the better the shield, like, so let's say the class of the shield, the grade of the shield, and the size of the shield all figure into how much HP that the shield has. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a little weird sometimes, but... Uh, with size three shields, it's, then it's per side as well. You, it just divides them into four because um, there's four facings. So that's once the once the hit point pool is run out on that shield, the shield is down, and then you will have to fly away or, or not get hit, and then your shield will recharge. Now you can with the power triangle and the capacitor gameplay, which we'll get into during the flying and traveling section, that will recharge your shield. Uh, could go slower or it could go faster depending on how much of your power you put into it. Um, so there's there's a whole gameplay aspect to this. Let's move off of shields. Let's talk about power plants. Power plants, a lot of people, especially me, when I first started talking about this, it is we're not talking about the engine here, guys. We are talking about the accessory component that actually generates the amount of electricity or power for your ship. So think of it as like an alternator in a car. Um, if you're alternate, most cars, alternators, uh, most cars run off a 12 volt battery. Most alternators push out. It's being turned by the engine, but they push out something like 14, 14 and a half volts. And then that comes back into your battery. And it actually, since it's higher than what the battery is giving out, it charges your battery as you drive your car. This is not, it's kind of that, but it's kind of not. Um, your power plant, I'm assuming, is, even though it's not mechanically hooked up as far as I know, it's not, it's 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 going to be driven by your ship. Probably <clears throat> somehow mechanically. I'm not sure how it is or how CIG has that set up. But you have to have enough power coming out of your power plant to power the systems of your ship. Otherwise, your ship something isn't going to get power um they're right now in the game and i think this is future gameplay is going to be different but right now in the game there is no benefit of having extra power we we would think that if we had all this extra power that we could push more power into our shield recharge or our gun recharge or something like that but that is not how it works right now um, if you have extra power, it basically just goes to waste. Hopefully in the future that will change, but as a minimum, you need to have enough power to run your ship systems or your, sh you're going to be losing something, whether it's a thruster or an engine or a weapon or whatever. If, if you suddenly find yourself in that situation where you don't have enough power, then you can turn things off and turn other things on. Um, but when we get into the Urkel.games section of this video, I'll show you how to determine if you have enough power. And I would say for the most part, everything is is going to have enough power. Um, the current power plant iteration and the class of the power plant. So the class of the power plant does matter. You, you can get a little bit more power if you have uh, military or industrial. Usually industrial is the highest amount of power and they last the longest, too. They just don't perform. And when I talk about performance, Gameplay used to be different a couple years ago, but 
let's say your ship gets EMP attacked. Well, EMP is going to shut down your power plant, right? So you're not going to be able to charge your shields. You're not going to be able to fire your weapons. You're not going to be able to fly because you have no power to anything. That was the benefit of EMP. And right now, EMP, all it really does is do a big shield hit and it hits the shields and it makes it easier to hit somebody's hull because they have less shielding. It doesn't actually shut down the ships right now. Maybe enough of it would, but it, it doesn't right now. Um, if you have a military power plant, or what it, what it used to be is, if you went with military, you may have had less power than, say, an industrial power plant, but if you got EMP'd, you were able to recover faster because it's a military power plant and that's how they're designed with an industrial power plant you would have had more than enough power to do anything but if you got emp'd it, you're you're gonna wait two three four times as long to recover and, and, and then start your ship back up in the meantime pirates are boarding you or people are shooting you and you're dying so that's kind of how gameplay used to be it's not like that anymore but i do think that is kind of the way they want to get back to in the future so that is the current power plant iteration. And then grade A, B, C, and D do matter. And once again, when we go to Urkel, I'll show you the differences about the different power plant choices. And again, power plant is a generator of power. It is not your engine. That's a, Your engine is an engine. It's pushing thrust. Your power plant is electricity based. Next up, we're going to talk about coolers. Okay, coolers used to have a much bigger role in the game. They have much less of a role right now, and I don't know the future of coolers. Um, I'm sure they will have a point, but we used to, before the flight model changed around last year, coolers were very good at cooling down a ship when you used Afterburner. Right now, we have a charge system. When you use Afterburner, there is a meter on your HUD that will deplete as you use it. Some ships have more, some ships have less. Usually depends on the size of the ship. Um, when that goes down to zero, your afterburner or your, your, your thrust, your afterburner thrust has to recharge. And that ties into your power triangle. You can make it recharge faster or slower. It used to be the better cooler you had, the more, and you didn't have a meter, you could just afterburn. The more cooler, the better cooler you had, the longer you could go in afterburner without your ship shutting down. Yeah, that's when you ran out of afterburner, your ship actually just get too hot and it was shut down. Your engine was shut down, not your ship. And so that's why the cooler was important because it allowed everything to cool down. And depending on what grade and what, what class of cooler you had, it cooled down faster or slower. So that was kind of... And it did that for all the components, but mostly it was for afterburner and, and engine related. And that's why the cooler was important. Today's purpose of the cooler, I have no idea. I would imagine your ship components do get hot and your cooler uses it, but I have really to find anything, any stock cooler that won't completely take care of whatever you need, because I don't think coolers really matter right now. I think they'll matter one day, but I don't know what the current plan is for, for CIG with coolers. Okay, let's talk about Big Daddy. Quantum Drive. <laughs> the Quantum Drive, probably the single most important component on your ship in 2022. I say that not knowing what else is coming after 317, but right now it is it, it's all about time. This is this is your time component. First off, quantum is the same thing like in Star Trek is warp speed or in Star Wars is hyperspeed, but you are not traveling faster than light in Star Citizen. Because it's impossible to travel faster than light because of Newtonian physics. And Star Citizen does use a Newtonian physics model. You can achieve an engine speed that is a fraction of light speed. And there are different 
I don't want to say engines, but there are different quantum drives that allow your engines. I almost want to say it's like the expanse that allow you to become more efficient in the way you travel faster without breaking the light speed barrier. And we don't even get close <laughs> to breaking light speed. Like we're like, I think the fastest drive is like a close to a 10th of light speed or something. It's not incredibly, incredibly fast. You're not going from the sun uh, on earth the, the, in our soul, it's just on the sun to earth. You're not doing that in you know, eight minutes. That, and that's an incredible one. One AU is a big distance. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's not light speed. Okay. And let's talk about the class of the drive. Um, the class matters in quantum drives. Military drives are by far the, the fastest drives out there. Because they're made for the military. Military is all about speed. That does not mean they are efficient. They are extremely inefficient, right? So if you want to get somewhere really fast, you get a military drive. But you're going to use a ton of gas doing it. I mean, it's basically just pouring fuel on the fire. So they are very inefficient. If you have a ship that has a large quantum fuel tank then you'll probably be able to make it across Stanton without any problem, without refueling. Usually that's a size two ship or above. So if you have a Cutlass Black and that's a size two quantum drive, you can make it from Arc Corp to Microtech in one jump with the fastest military drive for a size two. And you're not going to have to worry about quantum fuel until you get to Microtech or you can get to Arc Corp either way. And then you'll have to refuel because you won't have enough to make another long jump. If you have a size one ship, there's only one ship in the game that can use the fastest military drive, the VK-00 for size one, and go from like our corp to Microtech. And I believe that is the Banu Defender. Every other drive or every other ship just doesn't have a big enough quantum fuel tank to make it. So you have to look at other options. Um, so... You still have the same classes of drive. You have military, civilian, industrial, competition, stealth. Obviously, stealth drives are made for stealth, and they actually are really quick. So most stealth ships have to stop and get gas all the time because a lot of the stealth ships are size one, like the Eclipse and the Sabre. Um, industrial drives that come with a lot of the larger ships, especially size three ships, they are extremely efficient but they are extremely slow so let's say that the Carrick I believe it comes with a size 3 Bolon quantum drive which is like industrial grade B or C or something like that I think it comes with a comma which is actually like the slowest drive in the game whatever it doesn't matter it, it's extremely slow but it's extremely fuel efficient meaning you're, you're barely going to use any gas to get to where you're going you're, it's, it's not meant to be a fighting ship that goes from place to place really fast. Um, you can always change out that quantum drive, and most people do while we're still in Stanton. Um, a lot of smaller ships that have size one quantum drives, they will use the civilian quantum drives. Um, what is recommended for a size one is either a voyage drive or an Atlas drive. And those are a grade B and then grade A for the Atlas. They are really close to the same speed. Um, the Voyage being a little bit faster. But the Voyage is the only drive with a standard quantum fuel tank for a small ship that can go from our corp to Microtech in one jump and still have enough fuel for that. Um, the Atlas can also do that. It's still very fuel efficient, and you'll save a little bit more gas with the Atlas. Either way, I would go with either one for size one ship. Now let's talk about Stanton versus Pyro. Pyro is way bigger than Stanton. Stanton is actually one of the smallest systems in the game. Uh, size wise. So once we get Pyro out there, there's not going to be a bunch of rest stops in between like there is in Stanton. There's going to be some and there's going to be planets and outposts and things like that. But if you have a ship that has a real fast quantum drive and you're trying to get from Ruin Station all the way to one of the interior planets in one jump, it's just not going to happen. Um, there's going to be times where you're going to run out of fuel. And so that's what that does is it actually introduces gameplay so you'll have some ships like the uh, uh the starfarer 
that will be able to do ship to ship refueling. And that actually it looks like it's going to come in in the in the next patch of 317. And you'll be able to pull up to a Starfarer and you'll be able to refuel with that ship. They'll, they'll be able to give you either quantum or hydrogen gas, and then you'll be able to keep on going. And so that's something you you could do as a player. If you have a Starfarer, you could set up your own business and then you could have people come up and refuel with you and you can charge them basically whatever you want. And they buy gas from you and they keep on going with whatever they're doing. So it's kind of cool that there's gameplay there, but you basically have to have better planning when you're in a bigger system like Pyro. And then there's like systems like Soul, like the system we live in in real life. It's really big. Like if you want to go pl Pluto to Earth or Pluto to the sun, I mean, that's a really, really long distance. Or we have a large solar system. So you got to think about things like that when you're when we have these extra systems in the game, which God, it'll happen one day, right? Soon. Trademark. And again, the Quantum Drive, it's probably deserves the most thought and it's the most important ship upgrade in my opinion. One day when we are able to have physicalized components, you'll probably be able to store different Quantum Drives in your ship and you'll be able to swap them out as needed. So let's say you're in Pyro and you need to have a really fuel efficient drive in your Carrick. It's going to take you 30, 45 minutes of real time to get from Ruin Station to the jump point but you do it and then once you jump into stanton you swap it out with the really fast military drive and you're able to travel much faster because um, there's rest stops in between or or it's just a smaller system so we'll see what the future brings for quantum all right let's talk about the fun stuff right missiles missiles okay oh my gosh we're half an hour into this okay missiles um Let's talk about missile rack size calculation. And I might talk about this in another part of the video too, but uh, if you're just watching this part, this is important to note. For missile racks, the first number in a missile rack is going to be the size of the hard point, which you need to know. If your ship has a size four hard point, then you have to put a size four missile rack on it. That doesn't mean you have to put size four missiles on it. You have to put a size four missile rack on it and all the ships will come default with missile racks, but you can swap them out. So that's the very first number in the calculation of the missile rack. The second number is, is how many of the missiles are going to be in the missile rack. And the very last number is going to be the size of those missiles that are in the missile rack. So let's say a standard uh, ship. Let's say I think it's a Hornet. It has a size three. I think it's a size three hard point. Um, let, let me actually. Oh, I have it up on Urkel right now. So the one of the missile racks that comes default with the uh, Anvil Hornet is a size three missile rack. So the first number is a three. The second number is a two, meaning it has two missiles. And the third number is also a two, meaning there's size two missiles. So it's a size three missile rack and a size three hard point, And you have two size two missiles. The other missile rack that comes default on the Hornet is uh, the two, two, one, meaning it's a size two hard point with a size two missile rack. And it has two size one missiles on it. So typically the way uh, those calculations work is every time you go down a size in, in actual missiles, so, like if I go from size two missiles to size one missiles, you will double the amount of missiles you can put on that type of missile rack. So in the Hornet example, if I had a size three hard point that has two size two missiles on it and I wanted to swap that out, I, I'd still have to have a size three missile rack, but I could put a, a three, four, one on there, which means it's a size three missile rack that has four size one missiles on it. And then I don't have to equip size one missiles or I could go up. I could say it's a size three missile rack and it'll hold one size three missile. And that would just be one missile. So it, it gets a little confusing until you get used to it. Um, let's talk about different types of missiles. Uh, there's IR EMCS. Is that confusing? I hope not. The IR stands for infrared. The EM stands for electromagnetic and the CS stands for cross section. 
Infrared is your basic heat seeking missile. It looks for heat and it's trying to find heat and that's what it's going to attack. It typically looks for the heat signature of the ship that you are locking onto. So it, normally it won't come back and attack other ships, but maybe in the future that might be a thing. The, the real way to spoof IR missiles is going to be a flare. That's in real life. Um, in the game, I believe that's called a decoy. Um, the second type of missile is an EM or electromagnetic, and it basically uses active radar pinging, active radar scanning to lock onto the radar signature of the ship that you're locking onto, and then it will go and attack the that signature. Uh, the way to spoof that is typically what's called a, uh, I believe it's called a noise. Uh, in real life, it'd be a chaff, but it'd be, I think, a noise. And it basically, it's something that emulates the same signal of your of your aircraft or spacecraft. And then the last one is cross section. Cross section is an actual physical uh, thing, right? It's how big your ship is in the cross section of your ship. So if you have a ship with a very large cross section. And, and, and obviously big ships like a hammerhead or something are going to have a huge cross section, but I'm talking about smaller ships like a, an, an Anvil Hornet or a Cutlass Black. The Hornet has a much smaller cross section than the Cutlass Black. But then an Anvil Hornet compared to an Aegis Eclipse, an Eclipse is like a stealth fighter. So it has a very small cross section. It's very, th it's not very tall and it's very thin and it's, it's very wide. But looking at it from the side, from the cross section, it's very small. So it has a small cross section. So it would be harder to lock a cross section, cross section missile onto a ship with a low cross section. That being said, none of the missiles I have found lately really care. <laughs> they all fail about the same rate. Um, and so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done on missiles. Um, I have found that the EM missiles uh, do the most damage, uh, followed up by the cross section and then the infrared. Uh, and I believe the cross section, I think, are the most expensive right now. And then the EMs and then the IRs. The IRs are pretty much the simplest missile to go on to. And if you're if you're close, then boom. Missile, and we'll talk about range here in a minute. Missile flight model. <laughs> so. Last year, the missile flight model was changed, and now it uses kind of an internal IFCS, Integrated Flight Control System, to move the missile to your target. That does not mean they're going to work every time, and there is a lot of desync in the game, and the computer NPCs that you fight, they will use countermeasures, even if you don't see them. And sometimes it, you just have desync or server errors or whatever, and missiles just do not work at all. Um, when you're fighting a player in PvP, they you can count on them to almost always use a countermeasure. And in the game, when you're locked on, um, you do get a ping that you've been radar locked. And then when someone fires a missile at you, it does tell you, hey, you have a missile inbound. Um, missile operator mode. You in Back in the day, before everything was changed with operator modes, you could fire missiles and shoot your guns at the same time. You cannot do that anymore. CIG is moving to an operator mode configuration, and there will be multiple operator modes. Right now, there's a mining operator mode. There's a missile operator mode. There's a basically a flight slash gun operator mode. You can only be in one at a time. Uh, scanning operator mode is a good example as well. You can't fire your guns and scan at the same time. Um, but when you're in missile operator mode, that's the only time you can actually choose how many missiles you want to fire, which the maximum is four. It does not matter what type of launcher you have or what kind of, you know, uh, missile rack you have. The most you can launch is four if you have four and your missiles have to load up into the launcher and it takes a little bit of time before they will go green and then they will be like, okay, I'm ready to fire. Then you actually have to lock on to your target in missile operator mode. You have two rings as you once you're in range, the first green ring is the basic lock. And then the second green ring, as it spins around, if it gets all the way to full, you will have the best lock that you can get to fire your missile. Your missiles might not have a full lock, but you might be coming close to being out of range. And then you might have to fire them without a full lock. So kind of a little bit of a, a risk reward situation, a little bit of trade off there. And so I keep talking about range. Let's talk about range. <laughs> um, bigger missiles 
Uh, the bigger size missiles have a longer range that you could shoot them from. But the opposite pilot, whether it's NPC or player, is going to have a longer time to know that that missile's coming, and they can either turn around and try to outrun it, or they have a longer time to shoot it down. And yes, you can shoot down any missile in the game right now. Obviously, the bigger the missile, the slower it goes, the easier it is to shoot down. The smaller the missiles, especially size 1, size 2s, are very fast, and they're much harder to shoot down. Uh, but they're all about the same to spoof. They're all pretty easy to spoof their lock. Um, and to spoof a cross-section lock, it's noise and decoy. Either one works. Um, I believe uh, the decoys are a little bit more effective. Um, but really, you can also just move around and dodge the missile. Like as it comes, you see it coming at you, just make a real fast maneuver, and it's not going to be able to catch you, and you'll be able to dodge that missile. It's probably going to come around and go after you again, but there's ways to dodge them. Now, the ranges vary depending on the size of the missile. There's an outside range, meaning like 10 clicks, like 10 kilometers. You can't fire most missiles until you're within 10 kilometers uh, of, of smaller missiles. But then when you're in an interior size, meaning for size three missiles, I believe if you're, if you are closer to the ship than three kilometers, maybe two and a half kilometers, you also are too close. You won't be able to fire that missile because you're too close to the target for a size one. I believe you can get up to one kilometer out and still fire that missile. Um, for like big size nine torpedoes, you'll be able to fire them from much further away, but you won't be able to get very close at all to be able to shoot them. You can dumb fire your missiles, meaning you can get close to a target and just shoot them. They will have no guidance to them. But if you're real close, let's say you're in an Aegis Eclipse and you have three or three size nines and you're real close to that hammerhead and it's not really moving or you can try to time it. You can just dumb fire all of your torpedoes at it. And if they hit, they hit. So you don't necessarily need to lock. So a lot of gameplay with missiles. And then uh, let's talk about torpedoes. Torpedoes are nothing in, except for a big missile. Anything that is a size five missile or greater is considered a torpedo because it's made to do massive damage. It's not made to get a fighter. A fighter is probably going to outmaneuver or outrun a size five torpedo really easily, but a bigger ship like an Indus or something, not so much. They, are, they will have to rely on countermeasures or shooting down that big weapon. And of course, the bigger the missile, the more damage it does. In game, the biggest missile we have right now, the biggest torpedo we have is a size nine torpedo, usually fired by the uh, Retaliator or the Aegis Eclipse. Um, I don't believe anything has a size eight uh, there's a, the ballista has a size seven. There's, I don't think anything has a size six. There's multiple ships that shoot size five, uh, torpedoes, um, as well. And then there are a lot of ships that can fit size fours, uh, size four missiles, which are really close to the tor the beginning torpedo size. And they do a lot of damage. If you hit a, an, uh, uh, an Aurora, an RSI Aurora with a single size four torpedo or size four missile, like coming from a Vanguard. It's going to blow up, but you could probably hit it with at least three or four size ones and it. That might make it blow up, but it still might live. I think four size twos, it's going to blow up and two or three size threes. You'll get it as well. OK, let's talk about next system. Guns, everyone's favorite thing, guns. I right, guess I know this is long. Thanks for sticking with me. There's a lot of information to go over. Let's talk about types of guns. You have different types of guns. First off, you have ballistic guns. They shoot bullets, right? Size of the bullet is, is different compared to the type and, and size of the gun. Um, you have laser slash energy weapons. Um, first off, it's called laser guns in the game and I believe in other media, but they're not real lasers. They are actually energy-based projectiles. And, I, and that's important because if it was lasers and it was actually light, it would go on forever and it would be, it wouldn't be a projectile. It would be just a beam. Um, but we call them lasers, <laughs> but they really are just energy weapons. Um, and then there's distortion weapons. Um, distortion weapons are, they are made for a certain purpose and that's to think of them like as like an EMP type of gun. They do an electromagnetic. They're, they're made to disable uh, ships. They're also made to take down shields really fast because they distort the electromagnetic of, of the shield on the ship. 
And then you have guns that really aren't in yet. Um, they, their damage types really aren't in yet. Something like a plasma weapon, which would be damage over time. Um, beam weapons are have been talked about a lot. They are not in yet. Um, the Banu Defender used to have a hit scan type of weapon. That has been taken out because uh, that was like an instant fire. There was no speed of the projectile. It just hit instantly at the speed of light. Those have been taken out. And that's mostly due to the server performance. And then gun sizes. Each, each of these guns um, fits on a certain hard point. And they, the bigger the gun, the more damage they will do. And then the type of the gun, which we'll get into, whether it's a repeater or a Gatling or a cannon, that will also determine the speed and, and then how much damage is being done. Hey guys, so as a late edit here, I realized um, putting this together, I forgot to talk about gimbals. Um, gimbals are similar to uh, the way we calculate our missile weapon racks and things like that. Basically, you have two options for the guns on a ship, and I want to get into this before we start talking about the guns. Um, you have the hard point size of the ship. So let's say your hard point size is size uh, four. Well, you can put a size four weapon, a size four gun, a ballistic, a, a repeater, whatever, uh, a laser, whatever you want on there, and it will fire fixed, meaning it fires in a straight, not a, so much a straight line, but all your weapons together fire in what's called convergence. In fixed weapons convergences, there's a point in space in front of your ship, and you can actually set it up in the options of where you want your convergence to be. Um, and your weapons will fire to that point. And that's how fixed weapons work. The option to fixed weapons is to have gimbals. When you have a gimbal, if you have a size four hard point and you put a size four gimbal on that hard point, then you have the disadvantage is you have to put a, a lower sized weapon on that gimbal. So a sized four gimbal gets a size three weapon. So you just go size down. The advantage of the gimbals is that you can, uh, if you by hitting the G key and getting the the dashed circle, you can have your guns automatically track targets that are targeted within that circle. And we'll probably talk about more about that later on, but um, having automatic target tracking, especially if you have like low frames or the servers in a bad spot, can really help out. Um, there's the disadvantage of it is that you don't have as much power as you normally would have with the guns, but your advantage is you're tracking really well. So that's kind of how gimbals work. The uh, one caveat to gimbals is there are size one gimbals, but there are not any size zero weapons right now that you can mount on a ship. So if you have a size one gimbal, you can mount a size one weapon on it. This is important for starter ships like the Aurora and the Pisces and the Mustang. All that stuff is size one hard points. You put a size one gimbal on it and boom, now you have size one gimbal weapons that don't do a lot of damage, don't have a lot of power, but they at least you have auto tracking. So, all right, let's get on and start talking about uh, more about weapons. So let's talk about ballistics. <laughs> like I said, ballistics are bullets, right? They actually use uh, a hard projectile uh, that shoots some type of, of, of a bullet out of it. Um, there are ballistic cannons, ballistic repeaters. Uh, I said ballistic repeaters twice. It should say ballistic gatlings, um, ballistic scatter guns. And um, those are the four types of ballistic weapons. Think of a cannon as a slow firing, high damage weapon. So like a howitzer, but not as big as a howitzer, but that's kind of the, the, the interpretation of the cannon. They are made to shoot slowly, but when they do hit, they do a lot of damage. And we call that damage alpha damage. So if I say high alpha or a lot of alpha damage, that's what I mean. It does a lot of damage per hit but it hits slower because it fires slower. Some cannons have a really, not just a slow fire rate, but the projectile speed is also slow. 
So that's why it's important when you're dogfighting to have that pip and to be able to hit that pip so the trajectory of the, of the bullet will actually hit the ship. Then you have ballistic repeaters. Repeaters and Gatlings are not the same thing. Um, a repeater does fire faster than a cannon, but it fires slower than a Gatling gun. A Gatling gun is a just a constant stream of bullets, and a repeater is a faster semi-automatic version of that. Um, so it's so a cannon's like boom, boom, boom. A repeater's like boom, 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 and a Gatling is boom, like a Tim Wardai, right? The go Gatling gun. Um, so I actually prefer if I ever use ballistics to use Gatlings, uh, Gatlings actually have the highest DPS because if you're able to maintain the, the, the targeting of a ship that you're going after and you're able to maintain it really well, the Gatling gun will get the most, even though it's the lowest alpha damage, it will, you will get the highest DPS because you're firing so many more bullets at that ship. So the DPS, the damage per second, is higher than if you were to use a repeater or a cannon. There are, you know, a repeater is kind of in between. It's the medium weapon. And the cannons do a lot of, think of that as almost like a sniper rifle. Um, but right now the ranges and things like that are are completely unbalanced. And I know CXG's working on it, but as of right now, I don't recommend ballistics to anybody. Um, and then we have the scatter gun, the ballistic scatter gun. It's a shotgun, right? It has a huge spread, meaning there's for every shot, there's multiple pellets that come out and they do probably the most alpha damage in the game. Just like if you were to shoot a shotgun at someone, if you were 50 feet away, and you shot a shotgun at someone, maybe one or two pellets would hit them. If you are five feet away and you shoot a shotgun at someone, all the pellets are going to hit them and you're going to take their head off. Right. But Scatter guns work the same way. If you are close to a target and you bam, hit your scatter gun on them, you're going to do a ton of damage. If you're further away, you're going to do less. Scatter guns fire extremely slow, but they do extremely high amount of alpha damage. So it used to be the meta to kind of come in real, fly real close to somebody and boom, 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 hit them with a scatter gun a few times. Let's talk about disadvantages of the ballistic weapons. Well, the biggest disadvantage of ballistics is that you actually have an ammo count and you will run out of ammo and you won't be able to use your ballistic anymore. Um, this never used to be a huge issue because we had a ton, even though we used to run out of ammo in the past, you could go three, four five dog fights or missions without having to go get more ammo. Nowadays you can barely complete one mission. If you can even complete it without having to go get more ammo. My biggest gripe when they nerfed ballistics in the PAX 3.14 was every ballistic ammo count was given by the size of the gun, not the size of the ship. Certainly a bigger ship would have bigger, bigger magazines and be able to store more ammo. So if I have a size four Revenant ballistic Gatling on my Super Hornet, yeah, there's the Super Hornet's a small fighter. It's not going to have a ton of storage for extra rounds in a magazine, even though it's at least as big as a Super Hornet in real life. And that gun holds twice the amount of ammo that the that we have on the on the Hornet in the game. Um, you get like something like 250 rounds, and that's not a lot at all, like at all barely one or two ships because you're going to go through ballistic uh, ballistic Gatling ammo really fast. Um, that's the biggest disadvantage of ballistics right now. It's going to change. And there's going to be constant balancing going on. And I'm hoping that the, the bigger ships will have more magazine capability and I'll be able to go back to ballistics. The reason is, is because of the advantage of ballistics. The, the advantage of ballistics is they are supposed to, for the most part, a portion of the ballistic should slip through the shield of a ship and actually hit the hull of the ship and do damage to the hull. That's important because that's how you blow up a ship. That's how you kill somebody else. Ballistics are meant to damage the hull, but the shields do stop some of the ballistic damage, but not all of it. A lot of it makes it through the shield and into the hull. Right now in the game, 
the ballistics have an, all of them have an extremely high damage uh, DPS slash alpha damage and that is to balance the offset of not having a lot of ammo so but if a ship has full shields and you're using ballistics on it you're going to run out of ammo before it really becomes effective if you can take down the shields of a ship and then just use all ballistics you'll blow it up really really fast so I used to love them but I, I used to use them in combination with laser weapons but you really can't do that anymore so let's talk about laser guns laser guns you have laser cannons laser repeaters and laser scatter guns there is no laser gatling gun laser cannons work a lot like ballistics they are bigger guns that do higher alpha damage but they fire much slower the repeaters are kind of in between a ballistic repeater and a ballistic gatling they fire very quickly um but they do they do less alpha damage but if you can get your your target on it you know, on the pip and you're shooting at another person they will do more dps because they fire faster and then the laser scatter gun is the same thing as a ballistic scatter gun or a shotgun but it's a laser shotgun so you still need to get in close to get the most pellets on them um and there's only one company that sells laser scatter, laser scatter guns that is hurston dynamics and you can only buy buy them at lorville over in the hurston uh, showcase so the disadvantages and the advantages of laser weapons. The disadvantage of laser weapons is that they do much less damage, but they are designed to take down shields better than they are designed to damage the hull of a ship. Um, it's an energy weapon, right? So it's made to disrupt energy like a shield. Um, it's not made to damage armor plating or a hull like a ballistic weapon would. The advantage of a laser is that really you never run out of ammunition. You just have to charge your ammo tank back up. And that becomes a disadvantage because smaller ships will have less of a power reserve to fire their, their laser guns. So you do have a count and it depends on your power triangle and where, how much power you are putting into lasers. But once you deplete your ammo count for the lasers, you have to wait because they have to recharge. Some of, you can you can if you give more power to it in the power triangle, they will recharge faster, and you will have more reserve ammunition. Although it's not a lot, um, but let's say a an Anvil Hornet. Let's just say for instance, it has uh, fifty rounds of laser at its its equilibrium of the power triangle. Once you're done with that fifty, it's going to take probably four or five seconds full seconds for those lasers to charge back up that gives the ship that you're fighting time to recharge its shields a little bit um, and hopefully get out of your way so it might take you a whole nother 10 seconds before you're able to re-engage them and shoot them but the advantage is you never run out of the ammunition it just keeps on recharging and recharging as long as you have a power plant in your ship so they're made to work together the ballistics and the lasers although they just don't do it right now some bigger ships like the Constellation, for instance, even the pilot guns have like 180 or 200 rounds of, of laser ammunition ready to go in its storage banks. Um, and that's pretty significant because they they come default as, as size four. So size four lasers do a lot of more damage than size ones. And they're gimbaled. <clears throat> meaning the gimbal will follow your target as long as it kind of stays within that gimbaled circle. So lots of uh, lots of ways to make things at your advantage or disadvantage here. Let's quickly talk about distortion guns. Uh, there's distortion cannons and there's distortion repeaters. The cannons, just like anything else, they are made to fire um, slower but do more damage. Uh, and this is distortion damage, so it's really just going to damage the shields and it's going to damage the supposed to damage the electrical systems of a ship. And then the repeaters, they fire faster um, and they, they do less alpha damage, but they still do damage uh, regardless. I don't like using distortions right now because they don't disable a ship. I think in the future they will. And that's where actual piracy comes in. You disable a ship, you come on board and then you take over the ship. The advantage of it is if you can use distortion weapons, and a lot of PvPers do this, and take down someone's shields real fast, and then you go in there with ballistics, boom, 
you're going to blow up that ship pretty quick. The distortions will take down the shields way faster than uh, laser weapons will. But they don't do any actual damage when it's just, just distortion weapons against the ship. So you can't have just distortion weapons unless you have a partner flying with you. So that's really all I got to say about distortions. Let's talk about turrets. There's two types of turrets in the game. And a turret is an external weapon that cannot be fired by the pilot while the pilot is flying. Um, there are remote turrets, which is where someone is sitting, let's say, on the bridge of a ship or at some kind of manned station, but they're not actually in a turret, but they can remotely, whether it's through VR or a screen, they can, they can control that turret and choose where it shoots. Um, manned turrets are where you actually physically, your character has to go to the turret and go sit into the seat. And then you will control the way that turret operates and shoots and where it shoots. So think of the man turrets as the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars, where, where Luke and Han actually had to go sit into those seats and they had to move everything around. Those are man turrets. Remote turrets is just, you know, you're sitting at a weapon station on the bridge and you click on remote turret and you're able to move it around. You still see it the same way. It's just as a, with a remote turret, you are in the safety of inside the ship and a man turret is much more involved because you're actually moving around in the actual 3D space. Um, operating the turrets, we'll go into the key presses and things like that when we actually go into a turret in the game and we operate it and I'll do all the key, the key presses and stuff. But you just as a general overview, you can choose whether to kind of follow the ship in a gimbaled mode, meaning as the ship turns, the the turret will automatically turn with the ship. Sometimes that helps when you're fighting a target as the ship's moving. Sometimes you don't want that. And then you can go into you can turn that mode off and you will be completely independent of the ship, which the which way you're turning. And then there's different modes like relative mode and stuff, and you can stagger the fire because a lot of turrets have more than one gun. But the big thing about turrets is turrets have their own power supply that is independent of weapons controlled by the pilot, and turrets are made to have much more ammunition, both ballistic and laser, than the pilot guns. The pilot guns are kind of designed to, to use the overall ship's power. The turrets, like I said, they have their own power supply. So if your pilot gun has, well, let's say, 50 ammo for the laser, well, the turret's going to have 250. That means you can fire the turret for a much longer time. Although, you, typically, turrets are much more inaccurate because you're not flying the ship. Uh, for ballistic ammo, if <clears throat> let's say you have 120 uh, for the pilot, well, the ballistic ammo for a turret is probably going to have somewhere around 500 to 600, something like that. So you you will be able to shoot longer and do and do more damage, but you need to make sure you're on target. Okay, let's talk about paints. <laughs> paints are great, right? Um, there is actually a number of paints that you can buy in game. Uh, typically, you buy those at the dumper depot shops. Um, at say like Port Olisar or Arcorp, um, they're very limited. Most of the paints that you can buy in game, um, they're just, it's the old school paints from two years ago, like basic green or basic white or something like that. And they're typically very, very expensive in game. If you want to repaint, uh, I think it's a, a redeemer or something like that. It's like 250,000 alpha UEC in game to buy a paint scheme for it. Now that's a big ship and think about the work it takes to paint that. Like if it was actually going to get painted, but it's also very expensive. Uh, another thing you can do is a lot of us have been doing lately in the past year and a half or so is CIG has come out with a number of paints um, for all kinds of different ships that we can purchase with real money outside of the game and then be able to use them in game. So if, if you're and they have they have some really, really good paint schemes and color schemes, camouflage and, and lines and Invictus Launch Week type stuff. So there's a lot of that. Um, but you do have to purchase those with real money. Most of them are fairly inexpensive. You know, you're looking at the five to seven dollar range. But for bigger ships, like if you want to get all three paints for the Constellation series, which works for any Constellation ship. 
I think it's like 30 bucks for the three paints or, or six paints or something like that. So they can actually get pretty pricey out of game for bigger ships. Okay, ship parts. Physicalization. <laughs> ship parts right now, components and cargo are not physicalized. And what I mean to say, I know a lot of people will be like, wait a minute. Components themselves are in the ships. There are, for a lot of the ships anyway, you can open a panel and you can see, hey, there's my jump drive. There is my shield generator. There's this, there's that. But you can't do anything with it. Yeah, there's a JPEG. There's a there's a manifestation of where that thing is going to be, but you can't pull it out. You can't do maintenance on it. You can't do anything with it other than know where it's at. That's what I'm saying. It's not really physical. Uh, the same thing with cargo. It used to be if you had cargo boxes in your ship, then uh, you couldn't run through them because they did exist in 3D space. Uh, they had collision. But right now, until the cargo refactor is done, cargo boxes are invisible. Th they exist. You can see them. But you can also run straight through them because they're not physicalized. They're, they're not a real manifestation of an object with collision. <laughs> Also, the ships, a lot of ships are supposed to have armor. Armor is not in the game yet. That has not been physicalized on the ships. One of the advantages of using a Hornet in the game is that an Anvil Hornet is supposed to have a ton of armor, meaning it's really good against ballistic fire. Well, right now, instead of that, ships have a hit point pool that is mostly determined by their shield size and, and what type of shield is on there, what grade of shield, what class of shield. And once that's used up, there's a I think there's kind of some kind of a reserve uh, hit point pool, and that is your hull. Um, once your hull is depleted, whether you have shields or not, your ship blows up. Once armor comes into the game and it's actually a physical thing, um, you'll probably have armor plating get hit and fly off, but a ship will be able to take, if it has armor, it'll be able to take many more hits from both lasers and from ballistics before the ship gets damaged enough to where it blows up. So a high armored ship is a good thing to have. Um, so like an Anvil Hornet will become much more valuable once armor is physicalized. Whereas right now it's, I'll be honest, it's not very good at all. Um, you'll be the meta right now in 3.16.1 is probably something like an Aegis Gladius, which doesn't have a ton of armor. It's not going to have a ton of armor. It's going to have a little bit, but it's very agile. It's very fast. It's very maneuverable. So you can dodge more shots. Um, you can get in behind people quicker where they can't shoot you. Um, right now, agility is kind of the meta, uh, not necessarily the size of the guns. So... Keep that in mind. That is something that's going to change in the future, but I do not think it's going to happen in 2022. And then shopping. Stores that sell this type of gear. Um, it used to be one-stop shopping in Microtech. You could go to Microtech and there's two stores. There's a Center Mass and there's a Mega Pro. And you could buy anything in the game for your ship, period. That's how it used to be. It's not like that anymore. Once Orison and the shops at Cousin Crows were introduced at Orison, they shifted around a lot of the components. So while Microtech does still have a ton of one-stop shopping, so does ArcCorp, right? They have, they have Center Mass and they have Dumpers Depot. So does Orison. Orison has Cousin Crows, which has, if you're into military components, most of the military components are at Orison now. Um... They've also moved a lot of components over to certain rest stops, like a Lagrange points, and you you have to go there to buy them. Um, there's there's a few components in there that are only sold at rest stops. They're not sold at any planet, which is kind of odd to me, but it forces you to travel in the game and to go to different places and see different things, and CIG can show off their world that they built, their universe. Then there are some uniques. Um, right now, the only uniques I've really seen is from Hurston Dynamics at uh, Planet Hurston in the city of Lorville. If you go to the Central Business District and you run up into the building and you make your way to the right side as you come in to the right, you'll see the showcase of weapons. And Hurston does make weapons. Well, the 
attrition series guns and the laser, the Dominator series laser scatter guns, they're only sold at Hurston. You can only buy them at Hurston. The the advantage, the the old advantage of the attrition series guns were that um, as you fired, as the gun got hotter, it actually did more damage. Um, that does not exist anymore. That is gone now. I think it'll come back one day. Um, but right now, there's three different size one to three laser repeaters, and they all do the exact same damage. They all have the exact same range and everything. So it's more about aesthetic than it is performance. Uh, and, but the, if you do are interested in a laser scattergun, the only place you can buy that is at Hurston at Lorville. So um, for ship components and shopping, what I recommend is a website called Urkel, E-R-K-U-L dot games. Um, it is called the DPS Calculator Live. And we're going to go to that next. And we're going to show you how I would do loadouts on ships. It's going to be fairly quick. So stay tuned. Okay, everybody. So welcome to this segment uh, where we're going to start talking about Urkel.games. Um, I probably use this website as uh, help with Star Citizen more than any other website, uh, period. <laughs> and I use it because uh, I outfit my ships. Um, I used to have a lot more money in game before they did a wipe in 315. Um, so every ship had custom components and every time there's a patch, I had to redo it. So I had to look at what I wanted on my ship. Uh, we're going to start out with the Anvil F7C Hornet, um, which is up on the screen here. Um, so when you come up to Urkel.games and we're not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but it gives you a lot of different information. Um, I believe when you first come up the... Uh, the configuration of the screen is not like my configuration. It's different, but I like my configuration like this because this is the way it used to be. And this is the way I like having my Urkel set up. So you can set it up however you want, but this is the way I do it. So I have a picture of the Hornet on the left. Um, I can select my different vehicles up, up in here. Um, I can save my loadout. I can add things to a card. I can share my loadout, reset my loadout right here. Um, and then it gives me some information down below the picture. Um, by the way, there's different slots here um, for different ships. Um, anyway, back to the Hornet. Under sustained uh, fire, I can see that having, and this is the default loadout for the Hornet, I can have, I have two size three uh, Panther or laser repeaters that give 234 sustained DPS and it tells me the load on them and stuff. Um, if I click this little side display info hub, it'll actually change the information to the Panther repeater. Um, anyway, talking about damage before we talk about details, um, if we add these two guns together, we could see that sustained fire comes with 468 damage per second. And that is 120 alpha damage. Um, that is, over here with this icon, which I don't believe will highlight, but that's guns, right? Then the one under it is turrets. The one under that is obviously missiles. The one under that, I believe, is uh, EMP damage. Then there's the shields, the power plant, the coolers, how much electromagnetic signature my ship puts out, how much infrared it puts out to start with, and then actual shielding, like... The Hornet, I take negative 4% physical damage because that is supposed to be the armor drop-off, even though there's not real armor yet. Um, and then negative 10% energy damage. I'm sure all these numbers will change. <laughs> if we look at the stats for the weapons, under the Panther, made by Klaus and Burner, it's a size 3 weapon. Uh, it's DPS burst. It's burst is 500 DPS. Sustained it, DPS is 234. That tells you all kinds of stats, how much alpha damage it does, its fire rate, 500 rounds per minute, its capacitor regen, 1.25 seconds, uh, all kinds of different stuff. And the speed of the ammo, which which does matter, um, 1,400 meters a second, um, <clears throat> its range, 1,540, so not a high range at all. Uh, it shoots one bolt per shot. Um it's, it's power to the EM, uh, temperature to the IR, how much it contributes, basically. Um, how much distortion damage it takes to shut it down. Um, 
for recovery, all, all kinds of information. And really valuable is how much it costs and where you can buy it. So I can buy it at Area 18. I can buy it at New Babbage on Microtech. I can buy it at Her L2 and Her L4. And that's it. That's the only places that sell it. <laughs> so a lot, uh, lot of information. If I go from sustained over to burst, it gives me 1,000 DPS. Now, this is when everything is full and I first start shooting. It gives a burst damage because there's like a... Think about like a charged capacitor. Um, but once I have maintains sustained fire, it's only going to be 468. Now, I can change things about this. First off, these weapons are fixed on the Hornet. Let's say I wanted to go gimbaled. I would click on the Panther laser repeater part up here right in the middle, and I could pick the mount or the weapon. And see, I can put different size three weapons on here. But let's say I wanted to put a size three gimbal on it. Okay, boom. Now there's a size three gimbal. That weapon is removed. If I want, then I can only equip a size two weapon, but I do have the advantage of a gimbal. So I can click on empty. Let's say we go back down to laser repeater and I pick the 227 Badger, which is 400 DPS. So we can see that this 227 does 202 sustained DPS. The 337 does 247. So you can see the differences between size two and three. It doesn't seem like that's that much, but over time per second, it goes up quite a bit, the higher weapon you have. But having fixed weapons means you have to be much more accurate. Whereas with a gimbal weapon, it'll help its aim assist. Now let's say I wanted to go back and I wanted to mount uh, a size three ballistic Gatling on there, which would be the Mantis GT220. And it has 800 DPS, same as the Tiger Strike. These used to actually be different. So now it'll show me, okay, now I have much more DPS because it's the ballistic nerf where you get a lot more damage but a lot less bullets. Well, with a size 3 ballistic, I could come down here in the Mantis GT220 uh, stats. I see, sure, it does, you know, 800 DPS. Over the, the course of the full load, it'll do 12,000 12, damage. It does 48 alpha damage, really low because it's a Gatling gun. Its fire rate is really fast, 1,000 rounds a minute. Um, ammo speed is 1,400, so pretty decent speed. The lifetime is 1.1 seconds of holding down the button. Um, the range is pretty much the same, one bullet per click, I guess. Um, but how much ammo you actually have is, is pretty... It's pretty low. Um, I don't. Does it even tell us how much? Damage? Yeah, right here up on the weapon, we have two hundred and sixty-five rounds. That's it. After and it fires a thousand rounds a minute, and you only have two hundred and sixty-five rounds. So you don't have very much time to to fire this weapon. You have three or four good trigger squeezes, and that's it. That's why people don't use ballistics. Um, but. You could. I mean, you could use it with the different combinations. So let's get rid. Let's let's go back to our. We'll we'll go fix weapons on this. We'll go back to an attrition three. I'm sorry, not attrition. We'll go to a uh, three three seven panther. The reason I don't use the attritions anymore. And you'll see the attrition, the panther, and the NDB thirty. They all have exactly the same stats. So it's all. Some of them require a little more cooling than others, and some of them are more expensive. That's the number one thing for me is that the Panther 337, it only costs $8,900, or Alpha UBC. The Attrition 3 costs 12000 and the NDB 30 costs almost 14000 But they all have the same damage, right? So I go with the cheaper option. Why not? We do have a gun under the nose, and it doesn't say nose gun, but I, I know this is the nose gun. So if we click this and we go to our weapon, Let's say we also mount another 337 Panther under there. This is my standard loadout with the Hornet right now. Three fixed size threes on the nose and one on each wing. And then what comes default with the Hornet is the store, all big bottle box that you're supposed to be able to put boxes up on the top of the ship. I don't use that because my Hornet is not a cargo ship. <laughs> I don't even care about box missions on it. So you could put different things on there. You could put a... Uh, size five gimbal and all um you're supposed to you can't put the you can actually put the ghosts center cap on there and the the long look radar with the hornet tracker um but if you have those ships why would you put it on a regular hornet it doesn't make sense uh 
So you would either go with the ball turret, which then gives me uh, size two guns. I would get two size two guns with the ball turret. Or if I went with the size five gimbal, which is a specialty gimbal, you only you can only buy it at certain places. Then I can put a size four gun on there. That's what I typically do. I do a laser repeater. I do a four four seven Rhino. So now I have four laser weapons on here. And the size four does 182 DPS compared to the size three that do 146. Um, then we can see that it takes, you know, a certain amount of ammo and all that stuff um, per charge up time. But you can come over here and mess with the power triangle and you can see what it changes everything to. Um, so I don't think it tells you how many rounds you would have. Um, but if we take look at our DPS here, we take our capacitor from from centered 620 DPS under sustained fire and go all the way to weapons. That means no shield, no thrusters. Now our DPS sustained goes to 1004. Uh, and that's because we have more ammo uh, because we give more power to it um, and it recharges faster. So that's a big difference uh, going from 620 all the way to a uh, thousand, right? And the burst damage on that is 2140 uh, compared to the standard burst. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The standard burst is 2140 and it stays that way. Sustain fire goes up. So you can test out different things here in Urkel and different loadouts and things like that. And that's what I use it for. Not just weapons, not just missiles, because here you can see, hey, this is what missile rack fits under the Hornet. I want, let's say I want one size uh, three missile. I'm going to change these to size twos. Uh, that one's already a size two. And then I want size ones on there. Okay. Well, now I can put, let's say, uh, an arrestor three cross section on there. I can put size twos. I could put two dominator twos, uh, put more dominator twos. And for the size ones, I want uh, arrow one infrareds. Well, now my missile damage is 21,000, right? But I have a mix of cross sections and EMs and IRs. When you get down to the systems in the in here, um, you can do shields, you can do power plants, coolers, quantum drives, paints, and thrusters. But thrusters, you can't actually change. Everything is locked. One day, hopefully, we'll be able to change that around. For the shields, you can see that it comes default with web civilian grade C shields. Well, that's 1,500 hit points in the pool. I can click on this, and now I can look up the different size hit point pools. Well, under civilian, uh, we'll see the web is down here at the bottom at 1500. However, as we go up, we see that the 7SA Concord from Bering is 1725, and then the 6SA is 1650. The ink are the lowest lowest amount of shields at 1350. So if we go 7SA Concord, the highest civilian grade, we can see it costs 12,650 at Bikini Point, or really anywhere. That's a civilian grade A shield. That's a good shield. It gives me uh, 225 more hit points just for that shield. Here's the thing that shields are nerfed right now. If I go to military, the highest I can get is an FR-66 with the same amount of hit points as the highest civilian grade A shield. Um, except it costs 18,000 versus the Concord, which costs 12,000. So you can see there's the only benefit here that you're getting between military and civilian uh, is nothing. The military costs more and it's the same performance, the exact same performance, really. Uh, it actually requires more cooling. Um, it might have some other little random thing of, of, of how it goes from. Um, let's see. Let's look at the stats over here over by 7SA Concord. Let's see what changes between them. So distortion max damage doesn't matter because you can't really shut that down with, with distortion. And the military has more health, so it'll be harder to knock it to actually damage the weapon. It's not worth it. It's not worth the extra money, right? We're going from 12,000 to 18,000. It's not worth 6,000. So I would I would stick with the civilian stuff. If I want a competition, see the competition doesn't even reach the, the highest level shield pool. The industrials don't, uh, they do reach it with the Palisade, but the Palisade's 23,000 Alpha UBC, and it's the same hit point pool. It's actually slower to recharge as well. Four to, uh, no, it's faster. It's faster. Military FR 66. The stealth 
shields. They do reach the highest with a mirage. So if you do want stealth, you, you would want to go with stealth components. So let's go down to power plants. There's only one power plant in the F7C Hornet, and it comes with a civilian grade C power bolt. 2104 power per second. However, when I come over here to the left and I look at my actual power bolt and my requirement, it's actually right now it's pretty high because we added weapons to it. So we are using 1,626 out of an available pool of 2,104. I don't like that number. I like to keep my power as close to halfway as I can. So I would actually upgrade, in this case, I would upgrade the power bolt civilian grade C. And I would go, it goes from 2,104. The highest it can go to civilian-wise is 2,314. And that costs 17,000 alpha UVC. If I wanted to go military, I could get up to 3681 with the JS300, which is actually typically what I used to use all the time. If I go to the JS300, now my power is under half. That's exactly what I want. And uh, it's sold at these various stations for 19,000. If you go to industrial, notice industrial is even higher power totals. Um, with the Breton being the highest at 4628 power, I don't need it. I have, I'm not even using half of the JS300, and the Breton costs 52,000 alpha UVC compared to the JS300, which is at 19,000. So I would just stick with the JS300 in this case. Coolers. Before we change out civilian grade C coolers, the Arctic storms, notice our cooling here. We're using 127K out of 400K pool. There's absolutely no reason for me to change my coolers. They don't do anything in game right now for me to need to change them. It's wasting money. If you did want to change them, you do the same type of thing. Uh, most people for coolers actually go to the industrials and they go to the highest level of industrial. In this case, it would be an ultra flow. But I'm not going to mess with them because I don't. they're not really used and I don't need them in the game right now. The biggest thing to change is the quantum drive. It comes with an EOS a civilian grade C quantum drive if we look at the table here on the bottom don't mind the 30 days thing because that's a false calculation but if i wanted to go from microtech to arc corp the farthest distance that you could travel in one shot in the game then it would take me with this quantum drive eight minutes and 44 seconds that's actually not bad the comma drive for the size threes for like the character that's like 16 17 minutes so double that. But the EOS is still not a great drive. It's a civilian grade C. If we go down the list here, we can look at the fastest drives or the military drives, the Beacon, the Siren, and the VK-00. If I were to pick the fastest military drive, I couldn't even make it from Crusader to Hurston without needing gas. That's what that red gas pump means. Uh, from Microtech to Arcorp, it would take me six minutes and nine seconds. And I would have to stop to get gas. So it would take me much longer than that. Notice that's only two minutes faster than the civilian model. That being said, I would try to find the drive that had either the most efficiency, uh, like the industrials, but look how slow they are. If I were to take the slowest, most efficient, sipping the fuel type of drive, the Goliath, it would take me 12 and a half, to almost 12 and a half minutes to get there from Microtech to Arcorp. What I do is I try to just meet it in the middle, right? And there's all kinds of drives here. I go civilian and I either go for the Atlas or the EOS notices at 844. The Atlas is at 821. Or I would go for the Voyage down here. The Voyage is six, uh, 6,000 kilometers a second faster than the Atlas. Um, it is a grade B where I believe the Atlas is a grade A, which means it spools up and down faster. Uh, but I could go from Microtech to Arcorp in 8 minutes and 2 seconds. Uh, so I would go a little bit faster than the EOS. And I wouldn't need gas. But as soon as I get there, I need gas because it takes the whole tank. Uh, let's go down to paints. For paints, there is the Hornet Frostbite livery, the, uh, the Victus Blue and Gold, and the Timberland livery. Notice none of these liveries show up where you can buy them in game. These are all liveries or paint schemes that you have to buy outside of the game. And then under thrusters, I can't actually change anything, but it does tell me how many thrusters I have, main thrusters and maneuvering thrusters, and how much uh, heat they use and the thrust capacity and all that stuff. 
The last thing I want to talk about is the actual Hornet, I guess, itself. When I click on the picture, it gives me the Hornet stats. It's a medium fighter, combat career. It's a size two ship, crew size of one. Tells me the hit points for the body, the nose, the total hit points, um, the dimensions of the ship, the mass of it. Remember, the bigger the mass, the slower the ship is, even in space. The speed of it for SCM, this is your standard combat maneuvering speed, 192. The afterburner speed with full afterburner is 1229, the zero meters a second. It's pitch rolling yaw stats, it's hydrogen capacity, and it's quantum fuel capacity. This 583 is a standard size one quantum fuel capacity. Then it tells me I can buy the ship for 1.4 million Alpha UVC at Area 18 Astro Armada. So before we get out of Urkel, um, let's say we, we picked all this stuff to be in our ship, right? Well, now we need to know where to get it. So what you can do, once you fill all this stuff out, you can hit non-stock items to cart. Click that. It says non-stock items are in cart. We click on our cart up here. Oh, well, look, here's all the stuff we wanted to buy for this ship. You could actually uh, change a lot of this stuff around here to it's going to one it's going to cost 125,000 alpha UVC which is not that bad but we could change all the stuff around and try to do as much one-stop shopping as we could um so let's say our our panthers um let's see this is crew l1 crew l4 arc l1 so probably uh let's say new babbage uh for our for our repeaters um for our missile racks we'll do new babbage for missiles themselves you see, saving time in this game is a pretty big deal. Um, if you can save time, you should save time. <laughs> Let's see, Crew L4. Is this a Crew L4? So Crew L4. So now we have two Crew L4s. Our shields, unfortunately, Orison or Crew L1. Uh, probably Crew L1. It's faster than going to Orison. Um, let's see what we got. Uh, or some Grim Hacks, her L2. Oh, we'll choose Grim Hacks. Um, Grim Hacks. X. And New Babbage. So basically, we're going to go to New Babbage, Grim Hacks, Crew L1, and Crew L4. Unless we didn't want the FR 66s, then we could change things out. Um, and that'll cost us 127000 But it's it's a shorter trip. Right? You only have a few places to hit. You can, and as you buy the stuff, you can click on the trash can and you can take it off your list. So that's one way to do that stuff for the ship. Um, last thing is I can I can have this loadout and I can hit. If you log in and you have an account on here, then you can save the ship and you can save it as new into your hangar. We'll call it the Hornet. Save it. And now it's the loadout is saved. So I can go to my hangar here. I can see, oh, here's the raft and here's the Hornet. Well, Here's a horn. I pull that up and let's say I pull up the raft. Well, this is the loadout I have for the raft. Uh, this is just a stock loadout, but you can see I can even switch things around. Let's say I go to the RSI um, Constellation Andromeda. Whoa, it's more stuff, right? And it's a bigger ship as well. So like for this one, I would leave all the weapons alone. Um, I like all these weapons in the way they, they are stock. I like all the weapons. Here they are stock. Notice there's a lock symbol up by the missile racks up here, meaning I cannot change out the missile rack, but I can change out the missiles themselves. These missile racks are bespoke. The shields, it's got a 5 CA occur, 100,000 hit points. Can that go up? It can. I would go with a 7 CA Nargun. For power plants, I look at my power over here. I'm under half. I have no reason to upgrade the power plants. But if I did want to, I would go with a military JS-400, which doubles the amount of power. But it also, for this size, it would cost 53000 per per power plant. I'm going to leave them alone. For the coolers, I look at my cooling. I'm barely using any of the cooling. I leave it alone. But the quantum drive sucks. The, the Bolong quantum drive, industrial grade C, very efficient, sips the fuel, very, very slow. It would take 13 and a half minutes to go from architect to Arc Corp. So that thing's going away. Um, because it's a size two, like I said, the size two quantum capacity will fit the fastest uh, military drive in uh, the game. for, And you can travel around Stanton, no problem with that. You have the Crossfield. 
the XL1 and the Jaeger. They're all really close to each other. The XL1 being the fastest goes for 94 grand. The Crossfield, 59 grand. And the Jaeger, 74. So I, I typically just go with the Crossfield. That takes my time from 13 and a half minutes to four minutes and 50 seconds to go from Microtech to Artcorp. Bigger ship, bigger quantum drive, faster quantum drive. Then there's paints. Notice a lot of these paints you can only buy outside of the game, but the dark green livery, you can buy at New Babbage or at Orison, and it costs 180000 off of UEC. That is huge. Um, and there you go. This is like a, a loadout here for the Constellation Andromeda. I could save it. Save it as new in the hangar. Boom. It's now in the hangar. My hangar is size 3. You can also look up data over here on the side. You can look up different things for ships and vehicles. You can put different filters on them. Let's say you wanted to look at um, EMPs. Not a whole lot of those in the game. There's only four different EMP generators. It doesn't even tell you what ship they go on. But you can compare them. You can see what their radius is, their damage, their charge time, unleash time. You can do the same thing for shields. Um, so we could filter. Let's say we just do military shields. Um, grade A. There's, there's, uh, the, these are basically sizes, size one, size two, size threes. Um, let's say we just wanted to do size instead of grade. So we'll do size ones. So here's all the size one military shields, um, grade A, B, C, D. And then we can look at how much pool there are, right? So we can filter this. Oh, well, the, the FR 66 has the most, um, and we can look at their stats as compared to each other. So, a lot of really good information here. And then even when you click on shops, uh, then I think this is a fairly new feature. You go to center mass area 18. Well, here's all the missiles that they have. Here's all the missile racks they carry. Here's all the mounts they carry. And here's all the weapons they carry. Tons of weapons in there. And it tells you the cost of them as well. So really good website. I highly recommend it for your loadouts. And that will cover Urkel.games. All right, everybody. So in this section, the the last section of the ship section, I know it's been super long. Thank you for hanging with me. But we're going to show you actually how to equip uh, your ship and load out your ship inside the game, because while it's important to have Urkel and to know what components to get, uh, you should know how to actually outfit your ship as well. So the first thing we're going to do is hit F1 and go into the Moby Glass. From the Moby Glass, we're going to hit the second tab, the Vehicle Loadout Manager. It looks like a little uh, airplane. We're going to click on that. Now, wherever you're at, whatever station you're at or base you're at or city you're at, you're only going to have the ships available to you at that at that station or at that place. It just so happens that I'm an R Corp and all my ships are here. Um, so all these ships are here and it's it's a bunch. But we're going to stick with the for now, the first example, uh, a starter ship, the RSI Aurora MR, the very basic package uh, and what I recommend for the starter ship for everybody um, if you're not going to upgrade to an Avenger Titan. Um, so we'll pick the RSI Aurora MR. It's going to give us a 3D model of the ship in the game. And of course, depending on where the background of your Moby Glass is, the blur effect may or may not <laughs> help you out. <laughs> sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But on the Aurora, we do have guns that are on, I believe, on the on the top and on the bottom. Um, and we're going to go ahead and first thing we're going to do is look at systems. You can tell this is a stock loadout of an RSI Aurora. It comes with a hydrocell um, cooler. And as, as we roll through the, the different systems here, it'll actually tell us, hey, this is a quantum drive shield generator um, over under the ship layout, and it'll tell us the size of it, at least. Um, when we actually go over here and in, in, in the second column and scroll up and down. If we land over the hydrocell, it'll tell us, hey, this is a cooler made by Juno Starwork. It's a size one. It's a grade D industrial, so it's not that great. Um, but it is industrial, so it's probably plenty of cooling, and there's two of them. Uh, but let's say we wanted to change it out. Well, here's a bunch of coolers over here, and it tells you how many are available and how many are in use. Most of these are probably going to be in use by other ships. Um, but let's say we wanted to put a different cooler on this. Um, let's say we wanted to use a polar. I could click on polar. And as I scroll down through my options here, I could see like the Drake Buccaneer, for instance, has a polar cooler on the right side. So I'm going to click on that and I'm going to steal it from the Drake Buccaneer. So now it's a, now it's ready to be equipped onto the ship. We can do the same thing here for power plant. 
click on the power plant. We could scroll through. Let's see if we have any available. Um, I don't believe we do. We don't. Um, but just going through some of them, looking at some of them, uh, slips through the JS 300. That's a great cooler. It's a, it's a military grade a, uh, and it's on uh, the Drake Buccaneer. So we're going to go ahead and steal that. Um, the quantum drive, the, the default quantum drive that comes with the Aurora is pretty bad. It's a grade C civilian. It's, it's actually really slow. Um, what I recommend is the voyage. And so coming down here, just a couple, uh, of, of, rows down is the voyage and i bought a bunch of these so i have nine of them available it is a size one gray b civilian but it's actually the fastest uh and and close to the most efficient uh size one cooler in the game or uh, size one quantum drive in the game so i'm going to go ahead and click on that and it pulls it out of the stock i already had available uh for shield generators i mean i'm sure you're getting it it's the same type of thing here um for shields i'm going to I'm going to go ahead and equip uh, dual palisades. And that's actually going to give me a higher ship uh, hit point pool, shield point pool, I guess. And so that's how you would do that. For paints, um, I do actually have some paints that I, I own real money uh, on the Aurora. And uh, so let's choose the icebreak livery that was given away, uh, I think, at the IAE this year. And it's kind of a cool white and, and blue color. So we'll choose that. And then under vehicle weapons, we can do the same thing here. Now, let's say we wanted to change out. It comes with a missile rack of missile size. It's a size two hard point, and it has that's the first two. The second two is the number of missiles that are that the missile rack can carry. Uh, and then the last number is how oh, what the size of the missile is. So this is a size two hard point that carries two size one missiles. Uh, right now, they're carrying two. Uh, marksman one missiles and that missile if i hover over marksman one it tells me it's an infrared size one uh, let's say we want to get rid of that well the first thing we have to do is get rid of the missiles we have to unequip the missile and then we have to go and we have to unequip all the missiles in the rack and then we unequip the other size one missile well now look now we have a ton of missiles available to us let's say we wanted to put on the task force one which is an electromagnetic missile if I click that, then the only missile available to me in the other slot is the Task Force 1. So let's unequip the Task Force 1. Let's go back to Missile Rack. Oh, look. So now we can put on a different Missile Rack. Instead of having two Size 1 missiles, we can have a Size 2 Hardpoint and one Size 2 missile. So let's change out that Missile Rack. And let's say we're just going to have one missile on the whole ship. And um, if we go down to the Missile Selection... Now we have all the different missiles, so we could we could uh, put on a Dominator 2 missile, for instance. And there we go. That one Dominator 2 is now on uh, in the missiles. We haven't saved our changes yet, but that's what our plan is. Um, let's look at guns now. So we have le weapons on the left, two weapons on the left, and two weapons on the right. We have the wings, and then we have up front. So I I'm not... I think the weapons on the wings, they are empty... And I believe they are in this uh, this little right under this one. It looks empty right now. Let's uh, let's use the rule of one uh, of a size one gimbal. Anything that is a uh, size one hard point, you can put a size one gimbal on it. You can put a size one weapon on that gimbal, uh, meaning all of our weapons on this particular ship would would end up being gimbaled, which is a good thing. That's what you want to do. Um, if you have a size two hard point. If you gimbal that with a size two gimbal, then you must put a size one weapon on it. So that's kind of the that gray area where I, I usually go for fixed weapons. Um, sometimes you have bespoke hard points and you can't change it out. And they're always gimbaled, like on a Freelancer or a couple of the guns on the Constellation. And then I usually go for a full gimbaled approach uh, with that because you know, why not use the advantage? Because you're, you're using it for some of it anyway. So in this instance, let's look at the left wing. Um, we're going to click on left wing. We're going to find the size one gimbal here. We're going to click it. Then we're going to go to the weapon. See how it moved from kind of the top down to the bottom on that first column. Well, we are going to equip a CF-117 bullet. Actually, we're not going to equip. Them. We're going to put a ballistic on there. Why not? Uh, we'll put a yellow jacket GT-210 on there. Um, I believe. Oh, we have some up here. We have some available up here. So we'll click on that and bam, that um, that gun is now attached to the ship. Usually it shows it on the ship model, um, 
right now it is not showing it on here but we'll see it in the game um, and we're going to repeat that with the right wing so we'll click on right wing we'll pick the gimbal we'll go to we'll pick the yellow jacket and so now we have a two laser repeaters two ballistic rep uh, gatlings and we're going to save the slowdown out by on the bottom right corner by clicking save changes boom now we've saved changes, and what, next time we go into the ship, it'll have upgraded weapons, upgraded missiles, a different paint scheme, and upgraded components in the ship. Let, but let's let's talk about a bigger ship, right? Let's let's look at uh, probably a much bigger ship. Let's go all the way back up to the top. Still a starter ship. We're going to pick the Aegis Avenger Titan, um, the Penguin, um, and the ship's a little bit different. It starts off with under weapons. Notice we have. Much many more missiles, right? So we have uh, four size two missiles. Let's say we wanted to go all size ones. So we're going to have to unequip all of the missiles we have equipped right now. And we'll go ahead and do that right now. We're going to change that missile rack out to a um, three, four, one, a size three hard point, four size one missiles. And now we can start to actually put size one missiles on there. So let's put a bunch of pioneers on there. And then we'll change out the other missile rack and we'll use uh, one size three instead. So we'll have one bigger missile and we'll use, say, a Thunderbolt three. Now, this ship's a little different. It has two size three weapons on the bottom on each, basically on each wing. And then it has a size four. Um, it has a what does it have on the front? Sorry, I, I used I usually have a size four. On the front, so on the nose right now, it has a it has a gimbal Mantis GT220. Well, let's upgrade everything and let's go to a fixed loadout on this ship. So we're gonna get rid of that Bagger laser repeater. We're gonna get rid of the gimbal altogether. We're gonna put a CF337 on there, and now that wing is no longer gimbaled. We're gonna do the same thing on the right wing, and on the nose. Back in the day, I would put a Remnant Gatling up there. This ship would dominate, but now with the way lasers are and everything, eh. I could put I could put like an attrition four on there. I'd have to steal it from a Vanguard Sentinel, or um, I, I bought actually a bunch of CF four four sevens. So I'm going to put one of those on there. So now this ship isn't gimbled at all, but it does have some rather large uh, laser repeaters on there. We'll go over to paints, and there's a bunch of different paints for the ship as well. We'll go ahead and choose the uh, we'll choose the Debazio De livery, and under systems. Everything here is still size one. So I the only thing I really need to change out is the quantum drive. And I'm going to, of course, pick the voyage. And then I'm going to save changes. And boom, next time I pull out the Adventure Titan, it's going to look like this. The systems are going to be like that. The weapons are going to be like that. So that, in essence, is how to outfit your ship in the Moby Glass in the game. Next up, we're going to be talking about flying and traveling and actually, you know, calling your ship out and actually going and flying in the game, uh, kind of getting used to we're going to we're just going to go over mouse and keyboard controls, um, how to call for a takeoff and landings, finding the entry points of the ship, things like that, spooling up your quantum drive and actually getting out there and flying in the verse. So stay tuned for that. And thanks for watching so far. Woo. What a long video, right? I mean, there was a lot of information in there, and I hope you guys learned something, and I hope you appreciate the amount of effort that went into making this section of the video. Um, I try to make the videos as comprehensive as possible, uh, but I didn't want to bog everything down, and I didn't want to give away too much about this game. A lot about Star Citizen is about exploring it yourself and just being amazed by everything that there currently is, even though we're missing so much technology still. So with that, that ends the ship section of the video. The next section of the video is all about flying um, and, and flying being the most. One of the really the most important things in the game. We'll go over how to fly and then we're going to actually go over missions as well. So uh, you, you can actually have something to do in the game besides just fly around in this space simulator. So with that, I'll leave you. Thanks for watching.